Good evening, y'all. Welcome back to another Sunday Night Electronics Bash. I'm Jeff. You, most of you know me, but if those of you don't, I'm Jeff Glass. Um, it's good to see you all again on a peaceful Friday night uh, coming to you from Chicago. Um, for those of you who might be joining us for the first time tonight, um, we have been spending the past, is it four weeks now? I guess this is our fourth week. Um, where we're talking about how to get started with Arduino from the ground up, assuming you knew nothing else. Um, but tonight, uh, as the, uh, the topic of this video probably lets you know, we're going to take a slightly broader view and talk about the fundamentals of electricity. Um, and the reason for that is, so I know at the end of uh, last Sunday night's stream, I, uh, I said this week we were going to talk about uh, transistors and FETs and relays and ways to control high power things using the Arduino. Um, and I realized, I spent the first couple days of this week like starting to prepare that <laughs> that uh, evening. And I realized that all of the things I wanted to talk about were like how you get the Arduino to output more current or more voltage or more power. And then I realized we haven't actually talked about in like a formal way what current and voltage and power actually are um, and given ourselves some like some definitions and some units to work with. Um, so I thought it would be good to like push that back one week and this week we're going to do a really thorough grounding in electricity itself. Um, there's going to be, <laughs> I will confess, a lot of slides in this one, but also a lot of demos. Um, so if you have awful traumatic flashbacks to high school physics, I apologize. I really, the goal is to not do like a physics recap. It's just that next week when we talk about, you know, oh, it increases the current by this multiple, or now we can stand higher voltages, I want you to have some intuitive sense and a, a deeper sense of what that actually means. Um, so as always, we've got the countdown going here. We're going to give stragglers just a, another minute to catch up with us before we dive in. Um, this is also, there's going to be a lot of different things to talk about tonight. I think all of these concepts are really understandable. Um, but tonight is a great night to ask the like, wait, what did you mean by that questions? Or um, what would happen if you wired things like this? Or how do you calculate... Um, this kind of voltage in this kind of circuit. You know, as we go through, um, we're going to, you know, I'm sure run across things that I'm not quite going into as much depth as I could have on. I've actually I've got a ton of slides, but I also just got, you know, a sheet of paper here or, you know, a bunch of sheets of paper because I'm sure there's stuff that we're going to want to talk about that's not in the slides. Um, in fact, as I've been sitting here, I thought of one more. It's going to require an additional color of Sharpie uh, to doodle think drawings with. So ask all the good questions um, or the bad questions, ask all the questions as they are, and we'll just, um, we'll answer them as best we can as we go. Lots of good people in the chat this evening. Hi, Michael. Hi, Megan. Hi, oh, it's, hi, Michael again. Um, Chris says, at least we can drink during this class. That is very true. Tonight, I am drinking a Hazy River IPA from our friends at Urban Renewal Brewery, which is right around the corner from me here in Chicago um, at Ravenswood and Catalpa, for those who know the city. A really tasty, juicy IPA, and it's a tall boy um, to hopefully alleviate the running out of drink problem that we had last Sunday night. Kenneth says, I didn't, you didn't drink during your physics classes? No. I'll tell you a really nerdy story right before we dive in. Um, I uh, felt very good about in high school, taking AP Physics and AP Calc were taught as one class by the same teacher. And it was one of those cool things that, like, it really, you know, physics at, a, at that level and calculus at that level, you need some physics examples to, like, be able to have examples for the calculus and you need the calculus to understand the physics. And so being able to sort of go back and forth between, like, sort of the book learning and the practical examples was really helpful. And I guess, in a way, that is sort of what the purpose of this, um, what this setup is as well. Hopefully we, we learn some theoretical things and we apply them to practical things right away. And hopefully that's better than not, <laughs> I guess. Um, well, with that excellent segue, let's dive in. So let's come over here to the slides for a little bit and talk about the fundamentals of electricity. Don't run away, I swear. There's not that many slides and they're pretty good. I had a good time making these. <laughs> Um, so just some of the things we're going to talk about today, and some of this may seem familiar, voltage, current, resistance, power, we'll talk about Ohm's law, which is uh, not intimidating, really useful, super useful thing, um, multimeters and how to use them, uh, resistors and LEDs and seven segment displays, which if you're following along, like if you got yourself a, uh, a getting started with Arduino kit and you opened it up three weeks ago and we started, you know, I've been throwing at you, I realized like put this LED here with a resistor attached to it and not really explaining why. And so today we're going to dive into 
of like the what those things are and the why we actually use them. Um, when we get to sort of the coding examples tonight, we'll talk about bytes and bits and some clever ways to use them to simplify our code. And probably we'll talk about some other stuff too, because um, as much as I'm going to try and keep this to a tight 90, we've been seeing uh, just how well that goes. So anyway, that's the scope of today. It's going to feel like a lot of different things, um, but I'm going to try and, I don't know, we'll try and keep it light. Okay, let's start from the beginning. Um, with an electric field. Most of you probably know that matter at a very, very small, like, you know, atomic level um, consists of things with electrical charges, uh, positively charged protons or atoms with positive charge or molecules with positive charge and negatively charged things like electrons would have a small negative charge. And like when you were playing with magnets when you were a kid, opposites attract, right? So your positive charge and your negative charge want to push toward each other. Uh, if you have two positive or two negative charges, they will repel. And so when you think about the way that the forces between those attractions and repulsions act on each other, they form this sort of field with these lines, you know, maybe we could sketch out in between an area of positive charge and an area of negative charge. Basically, if we were to put, say, a positive charge somewhere up by this top line here, um, we would, it would follow this line of force. It'd be pushed away by this positive charge, it would get sucked into the negative charge, and would trace out this path, and so on and so on for anywhere else in this field, right? So when we say electric field, all we mean is like where things would get pushed around to, what forces they're feeling based on the existing charges, right? Super, you know, things get, get pushed around. Um, and much like uh, other energy fields, you can have potential energy in this system. And this is the first time tonight we're going to use an analogy to gravity, which is kind of the field that we on an everyday basis are most familiar with, right? If you have, say, a bowling ball, or here, how you have this orange, and you lift it up some height above the ground, making sure you can see that there. Um, the reason we have an orange will become clear later in the night. Um, when you uh, lift your orange up above the ground, you're acting against gravity. And now this orange is said to have more potential energy than it did before. Uh, because if we were to release it, it would fall, it would be acted on by the gravitational field and would gain some downward force, some downward energy due to gravity. So we act against the field, we gain potential energy, we release it to the field, and it becomes, in our case, kinetic energy. It starts moving. In an electric field, exactly the same thing, right? If we were to take two positive charges, like... <laughs> like this light bulb and this orange, if we have the positive charge and we push them together, they're going to want to repel each other, and that is a form of electrical potential energy. Or, if our orange was negatively charged and our light bulb was positively charged, they'd want to attract each other, and as we move them further apart, they would gain additional electrical potential energy because they want to attract to each other, right? So, this concept of potential energy is basically, you know, when you move things closer to or farther from each other, how much potential do they have to want to either come back together or push themselves further apart? Potential energy. Um, now, we've been talking about this, like, in that first drawing, things, lines of force moving through space. When we're looking at this in terms of a circuit, all of these field lines pretty much are stuck within the wires of our circuit. Um, so you can sort of see here, this is a, a crude little sketch, and not by me, I can't take credit for it, um, where someone's actually drawn in the electrons in an atom getting pushed around through the copper wires of this circuit, um, because the electric field lines are pretty much contained to the copper. Um, this is actually a really generous example. Basically, all of the lines of your electric field become contained to your wiring. So instead of expanding out through space, your electrical potential is confined to, to the wires of your circuit. Um, and in a circuit, um, adding potential energy um, might be moving a bit of charge from an area of high potential energy on one side of your battery to an area of low potential energy on the other side of your battery, or an area of high charge to low charge. Or to say that another way, and we'll get to why this is important in just a second. Um, if we define electrical potential energy, just to be formal about it, the cost in energy to move a unit, a chunk of positive charge, from a more negative point to a more positive point, or the energy that we release when we let that unit of charge slide back downhill. So it's exactly the same example we were just looking at, right? If we define potential energy as we squish two things together, how much energy does it cost to push them together if they have the same charge? Um, or alternatively, when we release them to fly back apart, how much energy would they gain, right? I guess that's a very small proton and a large electron. Yeah, the, the scale of these examples is not necessarily perfect. <laughs> um, 
So these, the next two things are two units you're never gonna have to remember. So if you wanna forget them after today, you're welcome to. But in this definition of, you know, the cost to move a unit of, uh, you know, a unit of positive charge from a less positive point to a more positive point, um, when we say a unit of charge, it would be kind of silly to talk about the charge of an individual proton or electron um, because protons and electrons are really, 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 really tiny. Um, and so to use them as a unit for our everyday lives would mean that we basically would be talking in the, you know, billions and trillions of charges for anything that we would practically want to talk about. So instead of talking about individual electrons, we have this unit called the Coulomb. Um, which is about 6.2 billion billion electron charges or proton charges because they're equivalent, right? So <laughs> that gives you a sense of just how small an electron charge really is, right? The, the sort of smallest practical amount that we're usually interested in talking about is 6 times 10 to the 18th of them, 6.2 times uh, times 10 with 18 zeros after it, right? Um, to give you a sense of scale, that's about how many free electrons there are in a cube of copper, about half a millimeter on each side. So, right, so with, even with 6.2 times, 6.2 billion billion electron charges, we're still talking about a very small practical number. But anyway, Coulomb, when you hear Coulomb, just think a small parcel of electrons that's, you know, big enough for humans to work with. Um, and going back a second, we say, you know, the cost in energy to move this little packet of uh, charges from a, a positive point to a negative point or vice versa, right? So our packet of charge is going to be called the Coulomb and our packet of energy is going to be a joule. It's another sort of just standard unit um, that describes an amount of energy. And, you know, the technical definition we don't really need to get into for tonight's purpose, but um, it's about the energy to lift a medium sized tomato about one meter or I mean, probably an orange, right? So if I lift this from down here where you can't see it to a meter above it. That's, I've expended one joule of energy to do that, plus probably some extra to lift my arm and things like that. It's also about the amount of energy that it takes to raise a gram of water by about a quarter of a degree Celsius. So it's not a ton of energy, but again, it's not infinitesimal. It's not so small that we can't really think about it. And it's not so large that it's an impractical, right? So, so we have our packet of charges, a coulomb, we have our unit of energy, and that's going to let us define a unit for electrical potential energy, which you may have heard of before, it's the volt. This, which is, just to read it out loud, the potential difference such that moving one coulomb of energy through a potential difference of one volt releases one joule of energy. So, uh, let's say I have a, uh, a number of particles. <laughs> This is working out well tonight. If we had a number of particles sitting in space generating an electric field, um, when I introduce a particle to move through the field that they create, to move that particle, I'm either going to need to expend some energy to force it where it doesn't want to be, or when I let it move, it's going to release some energy, right? It's going to follow that field line. Um, if when I move that chunk of charge, one coulomb of charge, right, our little packet of charge, if it releases one joule of energy, or if it takes one joule of energy to move it, that is a potential difference in in that field of one volt. You can think of us as using the information gathered by moving these charges around as telling you about the properties of the field that you're in. So to go back to our gravity example, you can think about um, if you were to, uh, here on Earth, drop a bowling ball from head height onto the floor and observe in some technical way how much energy that released, a kind of shocking amount of energy, we would think. We would learn something about the strength of the gravitational field here locally standing on the Earth. If we were to do the same experiment on the moon, hold a bowling ball at head height and drop it, it would release less energy. And so by observing how these things move, we can learn about the field that they are impacted by. Right. So in our case, rather than thinking about gravity, we're interested in electrical potential, right? As we look at how these charges move around, we can learn about the electrical potential energy between the points that they're moving between. Or once we have control of voltage, we can apply some potential energy to the system and have a sense of how these charges are going to move within that circuit. Cool. That's probably the most technical we're going to get all night. So if we're, if we're breathing at least easy now, I think we'll be okay. And if we're not, we're going to do some practical examples in a second that I think will make more sense. Um, I just wanted to have you get a sort of intuitive, a slightly intuitive understanding of just what exactly a volt is. Um, 
So this is basically the examples we just looked at, right? If moving one coulomb of charge, this little packet of energy between these two points releases a joule of energy or, you know, uh, takes a joule of energy to do, right, said backward, we know the potential difference between those two points is one volt. And of course, all of these quantities scale, right? If we move a coulomb of charge uh, between two points and it releases a hundred joules of energy, we know the potential difference between those two points is 100 volts, yeah? So not, not the practical implementation of a volt, but um, just sort of what intuitively a volt is. Kenneth says he's already forgotten the number of electrons. You can honestly, you can forget that number of electrons right now. You can forget what a joule is, honestly, if you want to. Um, we've got to the volt, which is our practical unit. So we'll use that from now on. All right, so let's uh, do just a quick example of how you might measure volts in a circuit using a voltmeter, or in my case, part of a multimeter. Um, some of you probably have these or they came with your kit. If not, I really encourage you to get one. Um, this, I mean, th multimeters have become so, so stupid cheap these days, um, and even the cheap ones are pretty good. I got this knockaround one, I think, eight years ago at a hardware store and it's served me well you know ever since this one i picked up for 10 bucks uh, at what used to be radio shack um, and it does just fine like, it doesn't have as fancy of a backlight but that's about it um so if you're going to continue messing around with arduinos i ex you know i recommend getting a multimeter um, and a multimeter is basically just a bunch of different measurement functions rolled into one including a voltmeter so on my setup and here let's just zoom back in here I've got this little V here, so if I turn my dial to V, and mine actually, you might hear, beeps at me when I have the things plugged into the wrong place. I'm gonna move my plug back over there to my common and my V, my voltmeter setting. And then I'm gonna need something to measure. So I have my power supply off screen here that'll be connected to these two leads all night. We'll see if I remember to turn it on every time I need it. Um, and I'm gonna use our electron from earlier, which is actually a 12 volt light bulb to do a little demo with. Um, so one thing to remember when you're measuring voltages is, remember that a voltage describes the difference in potential in an electric field between two points, and that in a circuit, the, the field that's creating that potential is basically all confined to the circuit, to the wires and pieces thereof. So when you're measuring voltage in a circuit, you always want to be measuring across two things that are in the same circuit and um, that you're measuring across something, you know, between two points. It doesn't really make sense to say the voltage at a point is. We say the voltage between these two points is because it's a difference in energy, not an absolute amount. The, the caveat there is like often when we've established a sort of zero, a ground point, we often get lazy and say, well, this point's at 12 volts. In fact, you can see it on my screen here, right? I said this point where I'm going to connect my negative meter to is ground, and this point is at 12 volts. Um, but really what I mean is is 12 volts above ground. So as we're doing our measurement here, let's see. I'm going to plug in. I'm going to make sure my power supply is turned up to the right voltage. 12-ish volts. I'm going to connect the leads of my power supply across this bulb, and it lights up. Well, that's a good sign. I have a spare off camera should this one die, so that'll be good. And I'm going to take my multimeter here. Yours, like mine, may have two different voltmeter settings, and we'll get to that in just a little bit. One with a straight line and one with a wiggly line. You want to use this straight line, the DC measurement, for this particular measurement. Um, and I, your multimeter actually probably came with slightly different leads than mine has. Um, most of them ship with something more like this, which is good for poking into circuits and things. Um, because I'm going to try and talk and illuminate things at the same time tonight, I'm going to use these clippy ones that I also have. So... I'm going to measure the voltage across this light bulb, and I see that it is 12.16 12 uh, volts approximately. Then, assuming this is calibrated, which is uh, maybe not true. Um, so that's how you measure voltage in a DC system. If you connect the leads backward, you'll see that the voltage between those two points is just as valid. It's minus 12.16 volts. Basically saying, you know, in the first uh, in the first measurement, we had positive 12 volts. If electrons were moving from one side of the light bulb to the other, they were going, they would, each coulomb of charge would gain 12 joules of energy, I guess, to be technical about it. Um, when I connect the leads the other way around, it's telling me that I would need to put energy into the system to force the electrons to go back the other way. You can't damage your meter typically by hooking things up backwards like this, so don't worry about that. Palmer says, would that be measured with alternating citrus or direct citrus? You guys are a bunch of nerds. 
Uh, but I guess why else would you be here? So that's very simply measuring voltage. Let's see here what we have next. Uh, I'm going to actually skip the uh, potentiometer demo for now. It'll make more sense when we do it in a little bit. All right. So last chance to shout out questions. Well, not last chance, but shout out questions on current if you are on uh, voltage if you have them, because we're going to move into question. We're going to move into the topic of electrical current. So current um, electrical current is very simply the rate of flow of electric charges past a point or through a region. So what does that mean? Well, much like we use the Coulomb as our basic packet of charges when we're talking about voltage, we're going to continue to use the Coulomb when we talk about current. Um, a unit of current that we're going to use is the ampere, or usually just the amp. Um, and all that is, is one Coulomb per second flowing through a point. So if I have, you know, 6.2 times 10 to the 18th electrons, and they move, you know, past a certain point in my wire in one second, they stream through in a, in a second, I have one amp, one ampere of current flowing through that wire. Um, it could also be protons, but for our purposes, usually it's, it's electrons. Um, and that could be electrons flowing through a wire. Um, it could be electrons streaming freely through space and striking the upper atmosphere in the solar wind, right? Um, but as long as I had this, this little packet, this coulomb of charges flowing through a point once a second, I have one amp of current. Um, it doesn't really matter um, for our purposes, like if, if we're talking about a lot of electrons, a lot of um, charges sort of drifting slowly through our wire or a sort of a very narrow wire with things moving quickly through it, we're just counting charges as they pass us by. And if we have one, you know, one packet of charges per second, we have one amp. If we have 10 packets of charges, we have 60 billion billion electrons per second, we have 10 amps. If we have, you know, a tenth of that, we have a tenth of an amp, and so on, right? It doesn't tell us anything else about how these charges are moving, just we're just counting them as they pass us by, right? So let's look real quickly at measuring current. Um, I'm going to turn this off so it doesn't get too boiling hot. Ooh, that's pretty boiling hot. I'm going to switch to backup bulb. Um, so current. Um, we have a current setting on our multimeter as well. Um, in mine, I actually have three different measurement ranges. I have A for amps, M for milliamps or thousandths of an amp. And uh, this is the mu symbol, the Greek mu for micro, for microamps or uh, millionths of an amp. Um, for my purposes, I'm going to start with things on the amp range. And it again tells me to move my plug over to my 10 amp setting. Um, and this is a mistake I see happen a lot, people putting their probes in the wrong places in their circuit to actually measure voltage or current. Um, voltage, we said we want to be measuring across something. We want to have our circuit established and then stick our probes in to measure across a specific object. For current, remember we're counting charges flowing through a point in a given amount of time. So we need the current to be flowing through the multimeter to be able to count those charges. So. Um, I'm going to wire up this particular demo like we see in our computer sketch here. I have 12 volts going into the bulb, then the current's going to flow out through the meter and then from the meter back down to our, our ground connection, our return connection. Let's wire that up. I'm going to turn power supply off for a second and fold out these little things. I chose little red bulbs because I thought they might be a little easier to look at on the camera of the stream. So hopefully that's working out nicely. Let's see. So here, what did I say I'm going to do? I'm going to hook up my positive side to my bulb. I'm going to hook up one lead from my multimeter to the other side of the bulb. I'm going to hook up the other lead from the multimeter to the power supply return. I'm set to amps. I'm going to turn my power supply on. Bulb turns on, and we'll see that I am drawing about uh, 0.321 amps, or 320 milliamps flowing through this bulb, right? So that's how you measure amperage. You insert your meter into the middle of the circuit because you want to count the charges that are flowing through the meter at any given time. Cool? Great. Questions about current? I will do some more examples that sort of synthesize all this together. I want to build up a few fundamental concepts and then we'll talk about um, how they integrate together into circuit use. Oh, that's good. All right, so power supply off so we don't roasty toasty ourselves too much. Chris says, it's not a Jeff stream in, uh, without him burning himself. It's true. Chris was here for a um, an LED experimentation stream that I did a long time ago um, where I did burn myself pretty badly. And uh, I don't want to give too many spoilers away for what we're doing later in the night. But uh, Chris, this might look familiar. If there's one stream that we do during this whole session that might end up with me burning myself or catching things on fire, it's going to be tonight. 
Um, let's talk about power. So we have two concepts already, right? We have volts and amps. The volts describe how much energy is released when a little packet of charge moves through a potential difference, right? Caused by an electric field. We have this concept of an amp, which describes how many charges are flowing past us per second. So if we put them together, we might be able to do something about, you know, uh, we're describing both the charge and how much energy it's releasing and how many of those charges are passing us in any given second. So when you combine volts and amps, you get a unit for electric power, uh, uh, which we'll get to in just a second here, um, which uh, basically describes the total power released by your charges as they're moving through a circuit, right? And you could have, you know, lots of different ways to build up the same amount of power. We can think of just a very few charges, but moving with a lot of energy, having a lot of energy released as they move through our circuit, or just a, a large pile of charges being sort of slowly, you know, moved by a gentle current, a gentle voltage through our system. Um, the analogy I like to think of is if you think of, um, think of a pinwheel, right? One of those pinwheel toys you'd use as a kid. Uh, if you're just blowing with your breath, which is a, a very small stream, you have to blow pretty hard. You have a small number of things carrying that force, and they have to move with some pretty significant force individually to get things to spin. But if you put your pinwheel out in the wind, when you have a big amount of air, even a slow breeze will cause that pinwheel to spin pretty fast, right? So when we talk about power, we're synthesizing this idea of how many charges and how much energy are they going to be releasing. And the unit for both of those put together is the watt, which you may have heard of. And a watt is simply one amp times one volt, or in other words, one coulomb per second, right, an amp, moving through a potential difference that releases one joule of energy when it moves across that difference, right? So if I have a current of one amp, right, I'm counting one packet of charge move past me every second, and it's moving through a field that releases one joule uh, with that movement, right, it's one volt, then I'm releasing one watt of power as I, as I move those charges along. You'll often see this equation written as P equals IV, uh, power equals current times voltage. The I here is because Mr. Ampere, who the amp is named after, um, described this uh, not as current, but as the intensity of current, as he was writing it in his original paper and used the uh, the letter I to stand for current, and we've been doing the same thing ever since. So I, in our case, will be current, and the unit is the amp. All right, so um, just to give you um, the sort of the first intuitive examples of, um, of units that we've looked at tonight, um, a watt of energy is about as much as a traditional Christmas light bulb. Um, one of these old C9 bulbs style that you might have seen on your Christmas tree or your, your grandparents' Christmas tree. Um, that releases about a watt of energy. Um, a watt, for what it's worth, is a, uh, a joule per second, right? So that little tiny unit of energy that we talked about, right, which was, you know, lifting the orange over my head. Uh, if I were to do that once a second, every second, I would be expending, you know, one watt to, to do that. Um, some sort of higher wattage examples, light bulbs, like the kind we'll be looking at tonight, might have a, you know, between 25 and 100 watts is typical for a household light bulb. The little one I have on the table here tonight, that little red one we were playing with, is a four watt light bulb. Um, your coffee maker is about uh, six, 800 watts. Um, as we looked at our, our joules factor earlier as a, a thing that would lift, you know, a gram of water up by a quarter of a degree Celsius. So if you imagine you have, you know, many you know, hundreds of grams of water that want to increase by hundreds of degrees Celsius, you really want to be dumping hundreds of watts of power into it to try and heat it up in a, you know, a feasible amount of time. And then mechanical systems too, of course, like a vacuum with its big blower motor um, can draw in there between 700 and three or 4,000 watts of power um, just to get things moving, get that, that volume of air moving through your vacuum. Um, we can use, uh, to, to sort of look at some of these examples, like looking at light bulbs, I'm gonna use an additional tool tonight in addition to our multimeter, um, which uh, is a branded product called the Kilowatt, which is a great product. It looks like this the kilowatt. Um, and all it is is an electrical outlet with a multimeter built into it. lets you plug the electrical things into it and read their uh, volts, amps, and watts directly off of this display, which is awfully handy. So I'm going to start with, I'm going to not electrocute myself tonight, I have this here green light bulb, which claims to be a 25 watt bulb. But hopefully, we plug that in, we set this to watts, this thing is a 24 point, oh, there we go, 25, 24.8 watt light bulb. So that works out fairly well. 
uh, we can see that the amperage that it's drawing is 0.2 amps, right? So it's basically when you press that button, it rewires your multimeter into, you know, the, having the electrons flow through that part of the circuit and measures your amperage for you. And our circuit's at 123 some odd volts, let's say. Um, just to show us a couple other examples. I've got uh, this here, this is a 40 watt light bulb that I put a piece of uh, reflective tape over the top so hopefully it doesn't blind the camera. And I plug that in. We'll see, it turns on. Fast drive pulling just a little bit over 40 watts. 3.34 uh, amps and the same voltage, right? Because the voltage is defined by the potential difference coming out of the wall. The power company is doing everything they can to try and keep this voltage at, you know, approximately 120 volts, at least here in the in my part of the United States, right? And then just to give you a, a final bit of food for thought, I've got this bulb, which is a 65 watt bulb. <laughs> this is the burn hazard one, right? Set that back to watts, plug that in, Let's get the camera to focus. There we go, 65 watts. 0.53 amps and still 122 volts. There we go. Chris says, is it true that the numbers will change the light bulb is on for longer and gets hot, at least for incandescence? Ah, Chris, you're a little ahead of me. It's a good question. Um, we'll get to light bulb physics just a little bit later tonight. Um, I do want to say also, before someone mentions it, I am conflating AC and DC circuits a little bit for the point of this evening. We'll talk about what the difference between AC and DC power here in just a little bit. Um, but for our purposes, right, the volts that we're looking at in here and the volts that we're looking at in here, we can sort of treat interchangeably for the purposes of the math. Um, so, watts, you know, the, I think the, mo the most common place that people encounter wattage is in light bulbs. And in fact, uh, light bulbs of today have started to do a really unfortunate thing because incandescent bulbs like these that have a little tungsten piece of metal that glows hot were the standard for decades and decades. People have started to think of watts of light bulbs as equivalent to their brightness, which for a long time they were, right? A 25 watt bulb is less bright than a 40 watt bulb, is less bright than a 70 watt bulb, and so on. But now we have these fancy LED bulbs or compact fluorescence or what have you, um, and we don't have an intuitive understanding of talking about things in units of light. So we're still talking about them in terms of equivalent units of wattage. Um, so when I went to the store to buy some new light bulbs for various things in this office here, um, I wanted to buy something that was about as bright as a 100 watt regular light bulb, incandescent light bulb, and that's how they're sold. It was an, L an LED 100 watt equivalent, which really draws about 13 watts or something like that. So someday my dream is that we start talking about bulbs in terms of their actual brightness and intensity as opposed to their old fashioned, you know, wattage equivalent, but that day is not here yet. So that's watts. Watts, a unit of power, right? One joule per second or one amp times one volt. We did our kilowatt demo. Mm -hmm. So let's uh, let's think a little bit about the, the units we saw pop up on that kilowatt there. So when we plugged in the green bulb, um, we had about 0.2 amps flow at 25 watts or so. Um, but why those numbers, right? The 120 volts is not something we had direct control over, right? That's set by the power company. But what is it about that particular light bulb that caused it to only draw 0.2 amps and consume 25 watts? What is the actual difference between this bulb and this bulb other than color? What makes this one a 25 watt bulb and this one a 40 watt light bulb? We attach them to the same voltage. Why aren't they doing the same thing? Good question. Let's do a little experiment. So I am going to, once again, uh, hook up some loads here on the table, and I'm actually gonna bring both multimeters into this demo so we can look at voltage and current at the same time. So it'll take me just a second to set up here. So I'm gonna turn, this green meter is gonna be my amp meter. Uh, I think I'm gonna set it to milliamps for this demo because I'm gonna need a slightly, slightly more precision to look at. I'm gonna set my little meter here, has our, our same V with a straight line symbol here. Let's see here, I bet I can turn the backlights on on these. That may help us some. Yeah, there we go. Yeah. So now I'm going to take my power supply, which will be uh, attached to 12 volts, and I'm gonna hook it up through a something. And I'm actually gonna deviate from using light bulbs for just a little bit because light bulbs, as Chris sort of hinted at a moment ago, have some slightly weird physics that may obscure the result we're looking for. So instead, I'm going to use, you may have spotted on the table earlier, this piece of carrot with two wires stuck into it. I'm gonna do some science with it. I'm gonna move my wire placement just in case there was some corrosion from my experiments earlier today, right? So in my drawing here, this orange 12 volt load 
is going to be this carrot for now. So I'm going to hook up my power to my carrot. And I'm going to hook up my voltmeter, right, across, right, attached to my green meter here. I'm going to hook that up across my load. I'm going to hook that up to both of the same places that the carrot has hooked into. And I need my current to be flowing through my amp meter. So I'm actually going to disconnect this power lead from the carrot. And I'm going to reroute power through my amp meter. Connect those two together there. Make sure everything's actually visible here. Right, so this is just following, if it's a little hard to see what's going on on the table here, um, this is just following this circuit diagram exactly. So I have my 12 volts coming in, I have my carrot here, then power flows out through the ammeter and back in. And then across the, the input side of the carrot, let's say, and the ground, I have my voltmeter, my gray voltmeter here. Cool. So let's turn our voltmeter on. And we'll see what happens. We'll see if the thing is a carrot is not a great um, conductor of electricity, as you might have guessed. If you, there was a reason you don't see carrot-based wiring in your houses, so I may have to fiddle just a little bit uh, to make this uh, make this work as I want it to. So my voltmeter is registering uh, minus 12 volts, which just tells me my leads are backward, but that's fine. See no current here. It's possible I'll have to pause this and go get a fresher carrot. But uh, let's see. The other thing I could do. I have my ammeters here. Let's go down to microamps. Yeah, there we go. Yeah. Part of the problem was I was doing this experiment last night, and I think my carrot has dried out some since my uh, since my original experimentation. But that's all right. I have a backup plan as well. So I now have one microamp of current flowing through this carrot, um, which is not a lot of power, right? So we when we said that a you know a watt was one coulomb per second across one volt, well, I have a millionth of a coulomb across 12 volts. So really very, very, very little power here. Um, in fact, since this is so little power, I actually am going to take it up a notch. Um, and I'm going to use, I meant to get a fresh carrot for tonight, but I'm going to reuse our, our uh, electron, our orange from earlier. Because um, I think if we can get just a little bit more current flowing, we'll be able to see this a little better. So all I'm going to do is take these wires out of this carrot and plug them into this orange. My, uh, my workbench now has like a fresh, zesty, citrusy smell, which is kind of nice. Let's turn that power supply back on. There we go. Yes, is that doing the thing? Seems to be, I only have one 1.3 microamps flowing, which is a little bit less than I'd hoped. Now, my power supply will go up high enough, I think, to make this demo still practicable. Um, but that'll be all right. Um, so, um, what I want you to see, and this is a slightly lower current than I was uh, <laughs> than I was hoping for, so we'll, we'll see if this demo still makes sense. Um, but, right, much, the question we were trying to answer was, what makes this light bulb different from this light bulb? What are the physical properties of an object such that when we apply a voltage across them, why do we get this much current? Well, the thing I want to illustrate is, watch what happens when I turn the voltage up. I'm going to reach over and turn the voltage up on my power supply. You'll see the voltage increase on this voltmeter here. If I turn this up to, say, double, 24 volts, I now have about double the current over here. If I turn that power supply down to half of its original value, about six volts, I have approximately half of the original current here. I'm having a little bit of struggle to see it, right, because this is only, you know, in the, the last decimal place, the tenth of microamps, so the measurement's not going to be super precise. But I think you sort of get the point that when I doubled the voltage, I doubled my current. And when I halved my voltage, I halved the current. And that's the, the thing I want you to take away. Because... Um, it is true that for many objects, and this demo honestly would have worked with the carrot as well, um, the current that the device will allow to flow in a given state is proportional to the voltage across it, right? You double the voltage, you double the current. You half the voltage, you half the current. Voltage goes up by a factor of a thousand. Current goes up by a factor of a thousand. There's a, the, little, the little key term actually in this sentence is that um, the, uh, the, the ratio between the current and the voltage is uh, it's proportional. Uh, for objects in a given state. Um, so, sorry if that screen just changed color. I'm changing my color correction just a little bit here. Um, 
uh, current in that device will allow in a given state is proportional to the voltage it crosses. Given state is just to mean that uh, if we're going to do something really extreme, then uh, this relationship might not hold. If I uh, were to put so much current through this orange that it caught on fire, say, or if I'm... Uh, looking at this relationship, say current flowing through water, and then I freeze the water, right? That's not the object in the same given state. So I can't expect this relationship to hold. But for sort of like things in a, a given state, a relatively narrow range of temperatures and physical properties, um, we see that for many objects, the current and voltage are proportional. Um, and when that is the case, we call that ratio, the proportion between the voltage and the current, we call that the resistance of that object. The resistance is defined to be the ratio between voltage and current. Uh, and we have a unit for such things, much like we've had units for everything else. Um, we define the ohm is going to be our unit of resistance for if we apply one volt across a resistance of one ohm, we'll have one amp of current flowing. Um, and like our other units, we can play around with that, right? If we apply 100 volts across one ohm, 100 amps will flow. Uh, if we have a voltage of 1 volt and we have 1,000 ohms of a resistance to put across it, then 1,000th of an amp will flow. Um, you often will see this written, you know, 1 volt equals 1 amp times 1 ohm, or V equals IR, using that I for current again. This is what's known as Ohm's Law from Georg Ohm, who sort of started to quantify this relationship between voltage and current in a lot of common objects. Um, you can, of course, write this in many different forms, but V equals IR is the sort of the, the one that you should probably hang on to. Um, so let's do a couple of quick mathy examples um, with Ohm's Law, because when we go to applying this to LEDs in just a little bit, we're going to need to sort of be really solid on how this math actually works. And I swear the math is not too awful. So if you're not a huge math nerd, bear with me, we'll get through it. So real quick math example. If our voltage is 12 volts, which it has been for tonight, uh, what value of resistance would limit the current, would make the current 10 milliamps. And it's important to remember when we're using this equation V equals IR, V is in volts, I is in amps, and uh, R is in ohms. So when we use, say, 10 milliamps, we mean 0.01 amps, right? It's important when we plug it into the equation that we're using the appropriate units. Um, so just to work through this math real quick, right, we have our equation V equals IR. We just plug in our values. 12 volts equals 0.01, right, 10 milliamps, 0.01 amps times whatever our resistance is. We just divide both sides through by this point, point oh 0.01, and my resistance turns out to be 1,200 ohms. Piece of cake. Um, we can probably do that as a practical example. I didn't prepare it, but let's do the second example, and we'll, we'll do this because example says one. Maybe I did prepare it. Maybe I'm cleverer than I think. Um, so, given that we found we only a 1,200 ohm resistor from this previous example, if we dialed that voltage down to 5 volts, how much current would flow in that circuit? Well, same math as before, right? I have my V equals I times R, so my 5 volts this time is going to be the current that I'm looking for times my 1,200 ohms of resistance. We divide both sides through by 5, so, right? So, or by 1,200 rather, so my current is 5 over 1,200. In this case, I get my, uh, my current here, this should be, this R should be current. My current is 0.0041 amps, or about 4.1 milliamps, right? So this 1200 ohm resistance, this, this you know, medium-sized resistor, as we might think of it, um, when we put 12 volts across it, gave a 10 milliamp current. When we reduced that voltage by you know, a little more than half, our current shrunk by a little more than half, right? You can sort of see how this linear relationship between voltage, current, and resistance starts to play out. Um, so here's a question that I wanted to ask. What is the resistance from the, of the carrot, or in our case, the orange, from earlier? So let's, uh, let's, do, that, let's do that math together. Um, since my example has changed a little bit here, um, we can actually do this math for ourselves in real time with some real measurements. So let's see. So let's take a few points. Right now, so if I have, let's call that 12 volts. Yeah, let's get this all arranged so you can actually see what's going on. If I have... 12 volts equals, we'll call this, uh, call it 1.7 microamps, 1.7 times 10 to the minus sixth amps times R, right? That's our V equals IR equation for this orange-based circuit, right? So if I just divide both these sides of the equation uh, by this 1.7 times 10 to the minus sixth, I will get the resistance of our orange. I'm not going to do that by hand. It's been 10 years since I've been a math miner. I'm going to do it on a calculator. I'm going to do 12 divided by 1.7 times 10 
to the minus sixth, and I get that my resistance is, in our case, R is about 7.05 times 10 to the fifth, or about 705,000 ohms. So the orange is a relatively high resistor. Thousands of ohms are pretty decently high resistance. So this is also the reason why you don't see orange-based wiring in your house if that makes sense. Um, let's check this though. So that's the value of the resistance that we calculated at 12 volts. Let's see if that relationship holds up. So if I were to increase the, uh, the voltage on my system to 24 volts, how much current should we expect to flow? Well, we, we looked at this earlier, it should be about double, but let's do the math and see how this works out, right? So I would say 24 volts equals current times 705 thousand. And again, using my, my sneaky side calculator, I'm going to do 24 divided by 705,000. And I should get that my current is approximately 3.4 microamps, if everything has worked out well. I'm going to turn that voltage up to 24 volts or so. We see... Within the limits of measurement, I'm about 2.9 microamps. So this is possible that my meter is not quite calibrated correctly or that it's struggling with a very small measurement. Or maybe there's something that's not quite linear going on within my orange here. Maybe 24 volts is the voltage that strange things start to happen inside of an orange. I don't think that's true. I think it's a problem with the meter. But it kind of gets back to the question that Chris was asking earlier about weird things happening uh, with light bulbs and other you know, devices that get hot. Um, just to show you a little bit, when I did this with a fresher carrot yesterday, this was the data of voltage that I pulled off of it. Get you over here. Um, so going from zero volts up to 12 volts, these were the currents in microamps that I measured to be able to put across that carrot. And you can see though, you know, obviously there's some waggle in these measurements. They basically formed a, a straight line. And when you have, uh, you know, this is what you would expect from a device that's acting uh, like a like a resistor. Um, things that have this sort of nice linear relationship that is a, you know, a constant proportion between the voltage you apply and the current that comes out of the advice. Let's see a couple questions here real quick. Uh, if you hold the clips here, let me come back over here. If you hold the clips in your hand, can you get the resistance of yourself? Uh, you could certainly try. Um, let's find out. I don't think it's going to harm anything. Um, but we'll get to, uh, we'll get resistance measurements in just a sec. I'm not going to put the live probes across myself, um, but we could certainly give it a shot. Um, but real quick before we get there, I just want to talk real quick about light bulbs because Chris asked this good question earlier. Um, so... Light bulbs, as Chris uh, noted earlier, and as I uh, found out sort of accidentally, uh, get hot, most of them, when you turn them on. Um, and a thing's getting hot, especially as hot as a light bulb does, sort of takes us out of the realm of objects that have this, um, this constant relationship between voltage and current in a given state. Getting quite a bit hotter takes you out of that state. So um, this is not my data, but some data that I stole from the internet of some voltage being put across a light bulb as it's heating up. You can see that the resistant, the resistance sort of changes as the, light, as the voltage across the light bulb gets hotter. Um, as that filament heats way up, its, uh, its properties change. And so in that way, we can't really talk about the resistance of a light bulb because the resistance means that it has this linear relationship across a range of voltages. You know, we could sort of think of like the, um, maybe the light bulb has a resistance between four volts and 14 volts, but really when you start to see this sort of non-linear relationship with things dropping off at one end or you know shooting way up into the sky, we stop sort of being able to talk about things having a resistance and more just describing what their currents are at various voltages, if that makes sense. Um, let me do questions real quick if we've got any. Ah, yes, yeah, so this is gonna be where we get to the um, the question about measuring resistance of myself using this meter. Um, before we do, I'm gonna turn my power supply off just in case something strange is happening inside my electron here. And turn my meters off as well. We'll do a little bit of tidying. You get out of here. So we have this range of objects, oranges and carrots among them, that display this linear relationship between voltage and current. Um, but obviously, right, oranges are not really a practical thing to put into your circuits, uh, neither are carrots, um, especially because, as we learned, like the properties of this carrot changed over time. I did this experiment this afternoon and was getting much higher values of microamps out of it, and then this carrot 
don't know if you can tell, try it out. And it's, uh, it's resistance changed, right? It's, it's now passing a lot less current than it did. And that is not a terribly desirable property. If I built a wire out of these carrots and then they dried, my circuit would suck. Um, so rather than relying on fruits and vegetables uh, to have these resistances that we need, we can just buy things with resistances that we need. Um, they're called resistors, and you probably got a bunch of them in your Getting Started with Arduino kit. Um, they're just a thing you can buy that has a given resistance over a reasonable range of temperature and voltage. Um, often they look like these little guys, and if you have some in your, in your starter kit, this is uh, probably what they look like. And again, this is for a, a reasonable range of temperatures and voltages, right? If you put a resistor in an oven or in the freezer, it might have a pretty significant resistance when you take it out or when you leave it in. Um, if you were to apply a really high voltage like letting them get struck by lightning, there's no guarantee that at sort of those extreme conditions, they're still going to have this consistent value of resistance. Um, but for sort of like the voltages like we've been talking about in these streams, 5 volts, 12 volts, um, and temperatures, you know, room temperature, even here in Chicago doesn't change that much, um, they're going to have basically a constant resistance. So let's look at a couple of resistors here on the table. I have to unplug all of these orange scented wires that I was using earlier. There we go. Get this other meter out of the way. Ooh, someone else from Chicago. Hi! Amazing. The weirdest weather we've been having. I mean, I know it's stereotypical to say that we're having weird weather in Chicago, but it's been the absolute strangest. <laughs> Michael Glass says, So at a constant 120 volts, a 100-watt bulb has higher resistance than a 40-watt bulb lower resistance and it's brighter. Why? Ah, cool. The resistance question I'll answer now, the brighter I'll get to in a second. So we're asking if we have a, let's say our 40 watt and our 25 watt bulb here. Um, the, the 40 watt bulb is releasing more wattage and the 25 watt bulb is releasing less wattage, right? 40 watts, 25 watts. Let's write this down. So we defined earlier a watt to be, that's why I need a whiteboard, a watt to be, right, one watt equals one volt times one amp. Our voltage is constant, right? So in our case, let's take a look at what's happening. We, we know our voltages, right, for both of these. We have our 40 watt bulb over here. We have our 25 watt bulb over here. Uh, in this case, right, we have 40 watts equals 120 volts times some current, right? Let's figure out what the current would be. Over here, we have 25 watts equals 120 volts times some current, right? If we divide both of these sides through by 120 volts, I get over here that my current is equal to uh, about a third of an amp. And over here, I get that my current is equal to uh, about a fifth of an amp. Let's call that 0.33, we'll call this 0.2 amps. So less current is flowing in the 25 watt bulb than in the 40 watt bulb. So what does that tell us about their resistance, right? Knowing that, you know, as they cool off, their resistance is going to change a little bit. Well, that's where we can use Ohm's law to tell us a few things because, right, Ohm's law told us that V equals IR. And now we have I and V so we can figure out their resistance. In the case of our 40 watt bulb, we have 120, make sure you can see that, 120 volts equals 0.33 amps times its resistance. And on the 25 watt bulb vibe, very similar, I have 120 volts equals 0.2 amps times its resistance. So in this case, if I divide that through, I get my resistance of my 40 watt bulb is about 360 ohms or so. And on my, is that right? Did I do that right? I think that's right, yeah. Um, and if I divide both these sides by 0.2 here, my resistance is going to be about 600 ohms, right? So the 25 watt bulb, knowing that as it cools off, things change, has a higher resistance than the 40 watt bulb, causing less current to flow and causing less heat to be produced uh, less heat and light, really, to be produced by these bulbs, right? A higher resistance means less current flow, means less power being released. Does that sort of make sense? That's a really good question. And we're going to do some more demos as we go through the night, sort of showing the relationship between voltage, current, resistance, and power. Ken says, the fun part is the light bulb was designed to be this specific resistance at its high temperature. So if you've used an ohm meter to measure it cold, it won't agree. Yeah, that's very true. We haven't talked about ohm meters yet, but as you can imagine, I mean, this is the demo that we were... We're literally about to do. 
you guys are so ahead of me. Um, we can use another function of our multimeter to measure most resistances correctly. Um, as Kenneth points out, if you try and do that with a cold light bulb, you actually don't get the answer that you'd expect, right? So we said for our 25 watt bulb, right? We said when it's hot, it should have a resistance of about 600 ohms. And in fact, we calculated that it would have that resistance by looking directly at its voltage and the current that it was pulling earlier. But if I take my multimeter here, I'm gonna plug my probe back over here into this side with this little omega symbol here, that upside down U is Greek for omega. I'll turn it to my omega setting, my ohms setting here. And on my meter, at least, this is like a multifunction setting. I've got a diode, I've got a little sound wave here, so I have to press the select button until I see ohms pop up on my little screen. Yours may have a more direct selector, but just, you know, that's a gotcha you can get. If I try and measure this 25 watt bulb directly, I'm gonna put my meter across it. We'll see what it shows. It may even struggle a little bit. Uh, bunch of mega ohms, bunch of kilo ohms. It's not quite sure what to do with it because it's putting a small, small electrical current across uh, the filament of this light bulb to try and measure it. Um, and uh, that's actually changing the value of the resistance a little bit. So this ohmmeter is definitely going to struggle with something like a light bulb where the voltage changes. But what it won't struggle with is a resistor. I have my little box of resistors here. I won't tell you its value. We'll measure it together. Let me put this where you can't see. There you go. So if I take my meter in ohms mode, in resistance mode, and I clip the leads to both sides of this resistor, we should see that I get, this is only 0.98, and you can see there are kilo ohms, right? Or 980 ohms, which makes sense because these are nominally one kilo ohm resistors. Now, resistors, like any device in the universe that we live in, are not made with ultimate precision. In fact, the cheapy ones usually have a precision of about plus or minus 5%. So 980 ohms from a, as we know, not perfectly calibrated meter, perfectly reasonable. If I needed more precision than that, you can buy higher precision resistors. 5% um, are sort of the I would say most common and cheapest, you can buy them in plus or minus 2% precision or plus or minus 1% precision, which is just to say if you buy a 1% precision uh, 1 kilo ohm resistor, that means that the actual resistance of that object at room temperature will be within 1% of 1 kilo ohm. So it would be between uh, 990 and 110 kilo ohms. So for a 5% resistor, which this is, being only 20 nominal you know, ohms off is actually not just bad. Um, could you show us the colors to know what resistor it is? I certainly could. We'll get there in just a second here. Um, so that's how you measure the resistance uh, of, of a resistor, right? Set your meter in ohms mode, um, clip your leads across the resistor. A little word of caution. Um, if you are going to try and find the value of a resistor, I encourage you to do it this way, sort of in isolation. If you try and do this in the middle of your circuit, you might be measuring the resistance not only of the resistor, but other things that are attached to this resistor. So if you ever have the chance to, you know, if you ever need to find out what the resistance of your resistor is, say if it's, you know, on your breadboard doing something, I encourage you to pop it off your breadboard, measure it, and then pop it back in. Or well, I would, that's best best practices. Sometimes that's not an option, right? If things are soldered in place and, and bodged down all the way to hell, um, you may have to sort of be careful that you're only measuring that resistor and not measuring all the other GAC that's around it. But when possible, do this in isolation. Um, to sort of illustrate the relationship between voltage and current in resistors, I want to sort of reset up the example we did with our orange earlier, but now to do it with a bit of hardware that's uh, sort of not fruit-based. So... I'm gonna recreate this circuit. Uh, I'm gonna hook up 12 volts across my resistor again. Uh, I'm going to hook a voltmeter in parallel with that resistor. I'm gonna hook that, that voltmeter to both of the same places. And I'm going to hook my amp meter in series. Right? I'm gonna let the current flow through that amp meter and then back to my power supply. Excuse me. This uh, hazy IPA from Urban Renewal Brewery is really getting me. So let's go ahead and get that set up here. Turn that off. I'm going to bring my power supply leads back in this one. Still smells like orange. I'm going to hook up one side of my power supply to one side of my resistor. I'm going to hook up my voltmeter leads here, which I guess I said was going to be my gray meter. I'm going to hook that up to both sides of this resistor as well. 
And then I'm going to take my current meter here. I'm going to re-plug in my plug. So I'm actually measuring current. And I'm going to direct that current through that current meter, that amp meter. So we'll set this to, I'm going to guess milliamps mode. Um, and I'm going to set this to my DC voltage there. Again, I'm going to turn on my backlight here just to make that one a little bit easier to see. And so now when I turn on my power supply over here on the side, we'll see some voltage appear here. I'm just going to dial that up until it says 12 volts. There we go. So now I have uh, 12 volts across this resistor. I have a current of 12.4 milliamps or so, right? So, and the ratio between those two is 1000, which is exactly the value in ohms of this resistor, right? V equals I R. 12 equals 1000 times 12 thousandths, right? And if I change the voltage here, right, we'll see that those things move in lockstep or more or less, right? <laughs> These meters are definitely not calibrated to each other. This resistor is, you know, wasn't quite a thousand ohms, but you can sort of see as I change the values of uh, a voltage there, the current is always about one thousandth of what the voltage is. Make sense? Voltage and current have a linear relationship defined by resistance, and the ability to purchase little devices called resistors that have that set value of resistance is really handy. Cool. So, as Chris alluded to earlier, um, <laughs> this is a, a little implementational sidestep, right? We've been talking a lot about theory tonight, um, and it, as, since we started talking about resistors, it's worth noting um, that resistors um, are labeled in what I think, frankly, is a pretty silly way. Um, when you start working with them for a while, you just get used to it, and it will, it will become a little bit easier. Um, but resistors are labeled not with numbers and digits, but by this color code. Um, and this is, a, a, I find, a big point of frustration for people who are new to working with circuits um, because this chart uh, is relatively easy to read, and we'll get to it in a sec, but the labeling tends to be inconsistent in real life. So let's look at how you read this chart. If you have a resistor, um, and we'll do this with the physical resistors in just a second here, they'll be labeled with these colored bands from one end to the other. And the colors represent either digits or multipliers. So uh, your... Uh, first one or two or three digits will give you a number that you then multiply by a value specified by the fourth band. So, for example, we just used a one kilo ohm resistor, and those resistors are, in my case, specified like this. They are specified as uh, brown one, black zero, right? So 10 times 100. And normally, you actually, you, you don't usually see this third digit of resistor here. Um, you usually see two digits and then a multiplier. So in my case, I have a brown, black, red resistor. Um, and then I will also usually have a tolerance band. I told you mine were plus or minus 5% tolerance, so it might be 5% over their resistance, might be 5% under, so I should expect to see a gold band on my resistor. This chart really encapsulates all the possibilities. Sometimes you do see this third digit. So you very rarely see this temperature relationship one, but you might. If you see a six-band resistor in the wild, send it to me. I want to see one. Um, normally, you just have a first digit, a second digit, a multiplier, and a tolerance. Um, one good question is like, my resistor is labeled, you know, from one end to the other. How do I tell where to start? Well, often you're talking about a either a 5% or a 10% tolerance in real life. So gold or silver will be this last band. And as you can see, gold and silver don't represent any um, any digits. So you know that your gold or your silver band is your tolerance band. So that's the end of the resistor. So start reading from the other end. Let me show you a, a practical example here. So let's take another, just so we don't have to unwire this. Let's take another one kilo ohm resistor here. Get this as zoomed in as it can be. Let's have a look. Oh, here. Let me show you one with a slightly better color. I'll dig another one out of the pile because on this blue background, it's a little bit hard to see. Let's see there. Will you focus? Yeah. All right. So probably a little bit tough to see in here. But at this end, I have a brown and then a black and then a red band and then a gold band right at the end there. Wow, that's really hard to see, huh? Brown, black, red, gold, which we knew from our chart should be... Uh, 10, 1, 0, brown, black. Red is our multiplier, so 10 times 100 is 1,000, or 1 kilo ohm, which is 
exactly what we said our resistor should be. And in fact, I knew it would come out to that because I labeled my resistor boxes with their color codes already on them. So that if I find a resistor lying about on a bench and I have multiple boxes laid out, I, uh, I stand some chance of identifying what it is. Um, just to do another example, um, I have some more resistors here. Let's see how these are labeled. Yeah, uh-huh. We'll see if we can decipher these. Let's pull one out of a bag. There we go. So again, I know a little bit hard to see on camera, but I'll tell you what the colors are. I see working from, I have one end that has a gold band, right? Right here at this end. So I know that that's gonna be the end. All right, so I'll start from the other end. I see gray, red, black, gold, I think. So let's see if we can decipher that. Gray, red, black, gold. So I have gray, which is eight. I have red, which is two. And black is a multiplier of just one. So this should be 82 times one or 82 ohms. And that's exactly what it is, 82. Ohms, 82 R, R in this bag being that's a resistor. So that's the, a brief view into how you handle resistor color codes. Um, the other thing you can always do, of course, is if you're like, I'm not 100% sure I got that right, is to grab your multimeter and just measure the darn thing in resistance mode. So again, if we plug things back into the right ports on our meter, we'll take our clips. I'll take my mystery resistor, plug it into both ends of the clip, and we'll see that I get in real life 84.4 ohms, right? Because everything's not quite precise. But yeah, so that's about right. So like, oh, that's probably an 82 ohm resistor. And that, that lines up with like, oh, I wasn't sure if that was a red or a brown. So that might've been 82 or 81. For most circuits, the difference between 82 and 81 ohms isn't gonna make a difference. So another, a real good way of checking what value your resistance is. Megan says, so what if mine don't have gold or silver? How do you know which end to start with? Good question. Um, according to the standard for labeling, you should also have this gap in between um, which uh, your, your sort of values and your tolerances over here, your, your temperature and your, your value tolerances. So that may be a clue. Other than that, it may be contextual. Um, for example, I knew that I had a little container of low value resistors hanging out over here. So when I grabbed this, I knew it, the multiplier was likely to be either black or brown. So I can sort of take a pretty good guess that like, oh, well, that's probably gonna be, um, that's gonna probably be the, the, the multiplier end so my value starts at the other end. For very tiny resistors, it can sometimes be hard to tell. Um, and that's a situation where you would definitely wanna get out your meter and measure. Um, these little guys, yeah, these are these are about as small as you can sort of practically use. They're about the size of a grain of rice. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, sometimes it's, it's just, honestly, it's just ambiguous. Thing says, the one I'm looking at now is red, red, black, black, brown. Well, let's see what that might be and we'll see if that illuminates anything for us. So red, red, black, black, brown. So that could be red, red, black, it'd be 220 black multiplier of one with a 2% tolerance. That seems plausible to me. Um, I th a 220 ohm resistor is a fairly common value of resistor. So that might be what it is. Let's read it the other way. So we said red, red, black, black, brown. So let's say brown, black, black, red, red. Hmm, interesting. So brown, black, black, red could be a uh, 100 times 100, right? So that would be 10 kilo ohms. But that last red, you, you almost always see this tolerance band. You don't usually see this temperature band. So that seems less likely to me. So I'm gonna guess what you have is a, uh, you have a red, red, black, black, brown. You have a 220 ohm, 2% 2 tolerance resistor. That's a good guess. If you have a multimeter handy, Megan, you should measure it and let us know if we got that right. But that's sort of like from context clues what I think is happening. Michael says the gold and brown in mine are very similar. Yeah, it's true. Like there are um, uh, the, the red and the brown, the gray and the silver can often be really similar. Um, it's not it's not necessarily a great system. And honestly, if you know, like if you like me are often buying inexpensive resistors or buying them in bulk, um, this is one of the things that... Uh, you know, manufacturers can cheap out on a little bit is like the quality of the dyes on their parts. So unfortunately, I don't have a great answer for you other than it, you know, sometimes you just have to, you just have to kind of guess and use context clues to, to work these things out. Um, yeah, but so, so that's resistor color code. I'm sorry you have to deal with it, but now you're part of the, uh, you know, the, the confederacy of electricians who now have to deal with uh, the fact that resistor color codes are not a great system. So <laughs> welcome to the club. <laughs> um, Let's come back over here. 
we'll see where we're going next. Mm -hmm. So we sort of talked about so far, you know, we put one resistor uh, in line with the power supply. Uh, we, you know, we basically just done a resistor by itself. What happens if you start hooking multiple resistors together? And there's a couple of simple properties to learn. Um, let's see if I can restart that there. There we go. Um, which is the following. Resistors in series, their resistance is sum. So check out this circuit here, right? I have three resistors hooked end to end to end. I realize I, I threw out this term earlier in series. In series just means, excuse me, end to end to end, right? And when you hook resistors together in this way, the total resistance of them is just the individual resistances all added up together. Um, so for example, if I have a, uh, a one kilo ohm and a 10 kilo ohm resistor hooked end to end and I put a voltage across them, the total resistance is going to be 1100 uh, 11 kilo ohms, that is 11,000 ohms. And we can, uh, we can do that demo in person. Clear off a little bit of this cruft. I've got my one kilo ohm, my 1,000 ohm resistor here from earlier. I have my 10 kilo ohm resistors here. And I'm going to use a breadboard to make these connections. You probably could get away with twisting these leads together if you're doing this experiment yourself, but the breadboard just makes us a firmer connection that we can rely upon more for the sake of our demo. So I'm going to plug in my 10 kilo ohm resistor here. We talked about breadboards last week, a couple weeks ago, but you know, in case you're you're new to them still, just remember that all the uh, all the points in a given row, these five, these five, these five, are all connected together. So as long as I press the leads of this resistor into the same row as its neighbor, right? I have this row has both resistors in it. Then those two things are electrically connected together. So now I have a wire coming in. I have my first resistor. It's in series with my second resistor, and I have my wire coming out. So if I set this back to resistance, yes, I take my leads, I hook them up to these two wires, and if I haven't screwed anything up, let's see, are we in ohms? We are. Oh, it would help if I actually hook things up correctly. There we go. We'll see what we get out here. I get a spot on the nose, 11 kilo ohms, which is exactly what we said we should get. I, ah, it's great. This is payback for the carrot thing earlier. My, my, my carrot was not behaving properly. My resistors are behaving properly. And if I have to make one trade, I feel okay about that. Um, so resistors hooked end to end, you should add the resistances together. Totally easy. Resistors in parallel. So in parallel means uh, that your the the connection points on either side of your device are connected to the same point. So this down here is a parallel circuit. You see things are not stacked at end to end. They have I mean, all of say the downstream ends of each resistor are connected to the same bit of wire and all the upstream bits of the resistance are connected to the same wire. These resistances add together in a slightly different way. The uh, the total resistance is the reciprocal of the sum of the reciprocals of the resistance. And if you are having math trauma, give me one sec. All that means is uh, if your resistances here for this example are R1, R2, and R3, you just take the quantities 1 over R1 plus 1 over R2 plus 1 over R3 and so on and so on. You add those all up. Once you've summed those all up, then you take 1 divided by that whole number again and you get your total resistance. Yeah, let's do a quick example, right? So let's take that same one kilo ohm and 10 kilo ohm resistor, and we'll put them this time in parallel with each other. So we'll come back over here. And this time I'm going to want these two resistors to be connected to the same two rows of the breadboard. Plug that one in there. Plug that one in there. And I'm gonna plug my wires into those same two rows of the breadboard. Make sure I don't screw this up this time. Yes, yeah, so there we go. So now I have my two resistors in parallel. You can see uh, both of the right-hand sides of these resistors are connected to the same row. Both of the left-hand sides of these resistors are connected to the same row. These two resistors are in parallel. So before we measure it, let's see what we should expect the equivalent resistance to be, right? So here's our equation. One over the total resistance is equal to uh, the sum of one over the individual resistances. So one over our total resistance is equal to one over 10,000 plus one over 1,000. We add these two terms together on the right, we get 11 over 10,000. 
we uh, can flip both those things on their head. We get uh, total resistance is equal to 10,000 over 11. Uh, and so our total resistance should be about 910 ohms, we should expect to see. Let's see, uh, let's see if that works out. So take my ohm meter here, hook it back up to our circuit. And assuming I haven't screwed anything up, I should get 980 or so. Interesting. So that's the uh, that's the resistance we measured earlier for just our one kilo ohm resistor. So that might be implying to me that something is not plugged in right here. If I unplug, yeah, something is something is not right. Something is quite wrong. Ah. There's a wiring error. See, if I, I unplugged one resistor, and I'm now showing an infinite resistance, which I shouldn't be seeing. There we go. That told me there was a wiring error there. Now, if I plug those two resistors back together in parallel, we should see I have 892 ohms, and I said I expect about 910. That's pretty good. That's close enough for government work, right? So when you put these two resistors in parallel, you get a total resistance which is less than either of the individual resistors. Um, and if you're, you know, I, I know that these, like, you add, add them together, you add the reciprocals can be kind of a, you know, a hard thing to remember and not something you're going to need in your pocket every day. But the way that I remember in general how these things are going to behave is thinking about them as sort of much simpler things, not with values, but think about like sort of the most extreme example of what a resistor is, which is just a thing that carries current. So think about this instead of being two resistors. Think about it being two wires, right? If I uh, if I have a wire that's carrying some current, and I give the the uh, the current another, I double the size of that wire. I add more copper to it, make it easier to flow. Well, then I'm going to have less resistance to the current flowing through it. Uh, that's this the the equivalent of putting two resistors in parallel, just adding more things next to each other, more ways for things to flow. Makes things less resistive, lets more current flow. Um, the other example would be, right, if uh, instead of thinking of resistors in series, it's like, well, what's, what's the formula for that? Well, if I were to uh, take a bit of wire through which a current was flowing and stack a bunch more wire onto the end of it, I'd have more total resistance. I'd have to do, a, you know, I have to have, I'd have less current flowing because the, the electrons are going to have to work harder to get through that long, long length of wire. Kind of says, as a professional EE, I would often pull up series and parallel calculators to do the math for me because I couldn't be bothered. Yeah, th this is a very good point. If uh, if ever you forget this, and I, I certainly am guilty of this too, um, you can Google a series resistor calculator or parallel resistor calculator, type in your values, and Google will give you the answer. That is a perfectly valid way to do these things. In fact, it's probably more important that you take away this general idea that when you stack up resistors in series, your resistance is going to get a lot higher, and when you stack them up in parallel, it's going to get lower, right? If you remember that and that gives you a place to start, then the calculators can do all the rest of the math for you. Um, just a little side note. Um, as, as a little cheat, because often what we're doing is stacking identical resistors in parallel for some reason. If they're all the same value, the total resistance is just the resistance of one of them divided by the number of resistors you have, right? So if I have five 1,000 ohm resistors, then my total resistance is going to be 1,000 divided by five or 200 ohms, right? It's the same math that we could, you know, that we use to do this problem. Um, but if they're all the same value, you can just sort of divide through by the total number of resistors you have. So that's a good, excuse me. <laughs> a good tip to keep in your pocket. Questions about resistors before we move on to other things. I realize I didn't ask what people are drinking out there tonight. I'm drinking, you might remember, a Hazy River IPA from Urban Renewal Brewery here in Chicago. Mm. It's very good. We did a, a large trip to Binnie's, our local liquor store here this week, to stock up for uh, some things we might need, including some tasty hazy IPAs. Mm, very tasty. Um, well, continue to think of questions and let me know what you're drinking. Michael's, Michael, it's a water night. Got a Bengal spice tea out there. Ooh, that sounds good. Kenneth's finally drinking his homebrew kombucha and he hasn't died yet, which is a good sign. Chris is going to resist asking a question. Thanks, Chris. Wow. <laughs> That's a good one. I'm sure there are LED puns coming up, so get those get those motors revving as we talk about LEDs. And this is going to be sort of the point where we start to put some of this together. Because, right, we this is, in, in theory, the fourth in a series of streams about using the parts of your Arduino kit. And all we've sort of done tonight is mess around with meters and voltages and amperages. What the heck are we going to use this all for? Um, well, in our case, sort of the most basic thing we're going to use it for is... 
powering LEDs, and really making sure LEDs don't blow up or catch on fire. If you're working out of a basic, you know, uh, LED, uh, Arduino kit, you probably got a handful of LEDs. They might look something like some of these, maybe like some of these little small little cappy ones, maybe a bigger one, maybe a square one. LEDs come in all shapes and sizes, but they all work essentially the same way. Um, and they all have essentially the same parts. Um, so your LED probably looks something like this. Um, an LED has two connections to it, and uh, for an LED, polarity matters. When we were hooking up our light bulbs, you know, I could be pretty cavalier about like, ah, oh, the light bulb's got two wires on it, I can hook up whichever side I want to positive and whichever side I want to negative. For an LED, that is absolutely not the case. An LED has two separate connections and it's important that you know which is which. One is called the cathode and one is called the anode. And for a physical LED, there are a few standard ways of telling which is which. Uh, on an LED with wires coming out of it with leads, the anode will always be the longer leg and the cathode will be the shorter leg. So I'm sure I have, oh, I'm, I have so many LEDs here. It's a bag of, uh, bag of LEDs that Kenneth actually brought me back from China. So if we look at this LED here, you'll notice I have a long leg and a short leg. This drawing here says you may have a flat side on one side of your uh, your little plastic housing up here. Mine doesn't seem to, but I have this long leg and this short leg. So I know my long leg is my anode and my short leg is my cathode. Uh, the long leg, the anode, is where you would attach your positive voltage or where your positive voltage would flow in. And your cathode, your negative side, is where your negative voltage would flow out. If you reverse those two, current will not flow. Um, and this is a property not just of light emitting diodes, but of all diodes. In fact, a diode is just a device in which current can only flow in one direction. So if you're working on an LED circuit and uh, no lights coming out, check that you don't have your anode and your cathode reversed. Your anode is your positive side. It is always where the where the positive voltage hooks up. Um, so this is a um, this is a circuit that we've used, actually, I think in every stream so far, talking about hooking up an LED to an Arduino. And I'm glad you've kind of gone with me on this because I kind of just threw this into the previous sections. Like, oh, I have this resistor and this LED, just hook them up like this and I guarantee it'll work. And I hope for many of you, it did work. Uh, but now we're gonna justify why we're doing it this way. Um, this was a circuit that we used when we were turning on this LED. We'd have to take this pin, this Arduino pin, <laughs> finally getting back to Arduino, right? Uh, we had to take this high to five volts and uh, we connect the other side of the circuit to ground. So we observe that our anode and our cathode are connected the correct way around and that our voltage uh, would be higher on the anode side here and lower on the cathode side here where we're at ground, right? So this is wired up correctly. So this is the circuit that we're going to, um, going to investigate today. Um, and I'm gonna show you how to choose this value of resistor and indeed why we have a resistor there at all. Take a quick peek at questions here. Let's see. Like to think that the longer wire has enough wire to make a plus symbol, says Chris. Oh, that's a cool mnemonic. Um, so in our uh, in our LED here, right, because we have our longer wire, if you were to make a plus sign, you'd need more ink or more wire to make that sign. And if you have this shorter leg, you need less wire or less ink to make that negative sign. That's a cool mnemonic, Chris. I'm gonna steal that. That's great. Um, so, um, I want us to think back just a little bit before we jump ahead. I want to think back to that graph, <laughs> that resistance versus, uh, that, that voltage versus current graph that we looked at earlier with our carrot. In fact, maybe I'll skip back and find it. Here we go. Um, so this displayed what the current was doing when we put a voltage across a basic resistor, right? And we had this nice linear relationship, right? I had four volts, I had a certain amount of current. If I made it eight volts, I had about double that much current. If I tripled it, I had about three times that much current. That's essentially the property of a resistor, right? There's this linear relationship between current and voltage. But uh, to show you the same graph for an LED looks pretty different. It looks like this. So here's what we're looking at here. This is the voltage that we're applying to our LED along this x-axis here, and here's the current that's flowing. So very similar graph, except you'll notice that instead of being that nice straight line, it's doing some funky things. Here's what it's doing. For small voltages, no current flows at all. Technically a very, very tiny current, but basically no current flows at all until we hit this point V sub D, what's called the forward voltage of the LED. When you hit that forward voltage, very quickly that LED will allow lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of current to flow, right? So down here, if you have, let's say, you know, the, a, a typical value for a forward voltage, and we'll get to how you find it in a sec, is two or three volts. So let's say down here we apply one volt to an LED, it's gonna emit no light, 
it's going to pass no current. Uh, 2 volts? Eh, probably not. 2.3 volts? Well, a little bit of current. 2.4 volts? More current. 2.5 volts? Quite a bit of current. 2.6, and now we're really, we're rushing off toward the heavens very, very quickly. Um, the other half of this graph, before I move on, I should say, um, shows the property we were talking about earlier, right? That LEDs only conduct current in one direction and won't let current flow in the other direction. Probably they, they, they let a little bit of current here flow in the opposite direction, the reverse breakdown voltage. Um, and then when they get to a certain point, right, if you put enough voltage across them backwards, they break down and they will let current flow. But typically for a light emitting diode, all you're doing is putting current through them in one direction. Um, and when you put, you know, enough voltage on them, suddenly that current will shoot off to the heavens, um, which is not good because when you put too much current through an LED, they burn up and die. So um, I'm not sure if I had planned to do a demo here. Uh, let, let's do one more slide and then I'll do a demo and we'll catch something on fire. Um, so we said a moment ago, LEDs have this forward voltage, this point on the graph where you apply slightly more voltage and all of a sudden they start emitting a lot of current. Um, that voltage is dependent on the color of your LED, or actually more scientifically, the color of the LED is dependent on a voltage. Um, the color that's produced by this LED is dependent on a certain physical property that's derived from the forward voltage of the LED itself. So for a green LED, which is what I'm going to do this demo with, just because it's what I happened to grab earlier, our forward voltage is going to be somewhere in the range of 3.4 volts. Might be closer to 3, might be closer to 3.6, but we'll see. So shortly before we get to 3.4 volts, when we turn on our power here, we start to see a little bit of current flow. And then shortly after we get to that forward voltage, we're going to see this current skyrocket. So let's set that demo up. Let's see if I meant to do this. I don't think I did, but I think it'll be a good demo. Let's see. Chris has no burning LEDs. I want to see magic smoke. Well, <laughs> you may be in luck, Chris. Let's get this, uh, get this demo set up here. So I'm going to think I'm going to keep using my breadboard since I already have it set up here. I'm going to connect the, let's see, I'm going to connect my power supply. Here, let's use a breadboard that has power rails on it because it'll make it a little easier to see what's going on. So I am going to hook up my power to these two wires here. Not turned on yet. I'm going to hook up my LED. Here we go. Let's see, I'm gonna wanna be able to measure the current across this LED as well, if I can. So I'm gonna leave myself a little gap there. And then I'm going to give myself a return path to ground. And I'm gonna hook up, I've been using this as my current meter. So let's set that to milliamps. Here, let's get rid of that screen. Oops. Oh, no, let's bring that back over here. There we go. Uh, I'm going to hook up my milliamp meter so that it's in series with my circuit, right? So uh, I've got my, my electrons all flowing through my amp measuring tool. There we go. And just so you can see it, I'm going to bring this guy back as my voltmeter. Let's get that out of the glare there. And I measure the voltage across my power supply so we can see what the voltage is doing. All right, turn my voltage all the way down to zero so we don't kill things too quickly. Turn my power supply on. This is probably not going to be a terribly dramatic demo, so don't get don't get too excited now. We'll get to the uh, the Bernie things a little bit later tonight. All right, so power supply booted up. I've got about one volt on it, and you'll see that there is no current flowing, and there there's one volt across my LED, but no current flowing, and that is as expected, right? We're in this part of our diode graph here, where you know we're below our forward voltage, so no no current essentially is going to flow. So let's slowly turn up our voltage. We go 1.8 still no current aha 2.2 so we're way below that forward voltage i'm seeing just a little tiny bit of light here i'm getting about 0.22 milliamps so even 200 microamps is enough to show a little bit of visible light in this led um, so we're still in this part of our graph where we're just we're getting toward that forward voltage a little tiny bit of current is flowing but not really significant, right? I, I've mentioned in the past, like an LED like this can withstand about 20 milliamps of current and be fine. So we're definitely gonna exceed that at some point. So let's dial this up a little bit more here. So I'm gonna increase my voltage just a little bit there and you'll see my current increasing. This is getting brighter and brighter, a little hard to see, I know. We'll get brighter to three amps, eight milliamps, 10 milliamps, right? So 20 milliamps is about what these, uh, 
what these LEDs are sort of designed to be able to handle. So I'm at 3.13 volts here, and about 20 milliamps forward, right? So now we're in this part of our graph, right? As I, every little increase in voltage is gonna rapidly increase the amount of current that this LED is allowing to flow. And the brightness, you know, is going to be in some sense related to how much current is flowing. The more current is flowing across this LED, the more energy it's going to release as light and the brighter it's going to be. But at some point it is going to die. So let's get there. I'm gonna dial this up slowly. 30 milliamps. And now three and a half volts, 40 milliamps. 3.8 volts, 70 milliamps. Four volts, 100 milliamps. Things do smell like burning. 150 milliamps. 160 milliamps. Ooh, you can see that current falling. Things are not going well in there. Six volts, gone. There it goes. We cooked it. We literally cooked it. We caused it to release enough heat as part of the light generating process that that LED is now toast. Let's make sure it's not... Ooh, it smells burnt. Very exciting. Make sure it's not too screaming hot now. It's not too bad. But now, I don't know if you can see, if you look down inside there, let me get a, a twin from it so you can compare. There is actually visible charring inside of this LED. So I'm going to put these two side by side. And you'll see, see there's a little black dot in the one on our right hand here that we were experimenting with? This one is literally burnt up, right? So we increased the voltage to uh, four or five volts and it was passing so much current that it was a tiny fire inside of there and we literally burnt the LED out. We accidentally did this yesterday and killed a little red LED. Cool to understand what's happening now. Yeah, exactly. So, so the LED itself, right, has very little ability once you're in this skyrocketing region, this forward biased region, we would call it. It can't really regulate its own current. It's letting a lot of current flow. And as you increase that voltage just a tiny amount, more and more current is going to flow, which is usually not what we want because in the context of doing this with an Arduino, we have seen we really only have two choices. We can apply zero volts or five volts. And if five volts is enough to make something burn out, what are we to do? Well, thankfully, we just earlier this evening, we, uh, we learned about a device we could use to limit the current flowing through something, the resistor. Uh, let's see. So, and this is the same question again in writing form, right? So LEDs conduct a lot of current above their forward voltage, but a typical five millimeter LED, which is the, you know, the technical term for these little dabby juice, um, can withstand about 20 milliamps of forward current. So we have to find some way to limit the current. So we're going to use a resistor to do that. Now, uh, we're gonna use our classic equation, V equals IR, right? Ohm's law that we learned about earlier tonight. Uh, the way that the LED factors into that equation is this, that forward voltage for the purposes of this equation, you have to subtract from the available voltage in your circuit right here. So uh, our green LED that we said had a forward voltage of, I don't know, 3.4 volts nominally. Uh, when we come to plug it into V equals IR, we're going to take our system voltage, our total voltage, and subtract 3.4 volts for it. So just to do the example out, if we were to hook up a green LED to an Arduino and use digital pin D2 to drive it on and off, so it's going to be right, remember, at 5 volts or at ground, right? 5 volts is high. How big of a resistor would we need to provide such that we limit the current flowing through that LED to 20 milliamps? Well, here's how you figure that out. We take our Ohm's law equation, V equals IR. So V in this case is our five volts that we're applying minus the forward voltage of our LED, 3.4 volts, equals our current 20 milliamps or 0.02 amps here times the resistance that we're looking for. So uh, we move things around, we get our resistance is equal to 1.6, right? We said take this 3.4 away from the five, 1.6 over 0.02, and we get about 80 ohms is the value of the resistance that we would need. So let's put that together. Um, I've got my Arduino here. I've got my, I'm going to throw this uh, dead LED away right now before I forget. Don't put it back in the bag. Um, I'm going to take my Arduino. I'm going to wire it into my breadboard here with a brand new LED and a resistor. So just like before, make sure I get my polarity right here. Yeah, there's my longer leg. Plug the longer leg into the hot side. And I'm going to take an 80 ohm resistor or so. What I have, the closest possible value I have is an 82 ohm resistor, um, which would be the reason that it was sitting on my desk for me to grab for that experiment earlier. I'm gonna plug that in in series with my LED. Plug that into the breadboard there. So we're just gonna replicate 
this circuit here that we've used it several times before and, and now we get to figure out why. So if I've done this right, we should only have about 20 milliamps of current flowing through this green LED. So let's make sure we got hook, hooked up everything right. I'm gonna take my voltmeter away just cause we know we're gonna be at zero volts or five volts or at least I think you'll, I hope you'll trust me on that. Um, let's see, oh, this is my voltmeter. We'll take that away. Leave my ammeter in the circuit here. So I'm gonna hook up my resistor back to this breadboard and then I'm going to put my ammeter in series right so all the electrons flow through this ammeter here make sure you can see that um, and then what do I need to do oh I need to hook this not to my power supply but to my Arduino so my what was my ground side goes into the ground connection on the Arduino Uno board here and uh, this side we said is going to what pin D2, which is over on this side here. I'm sure this is the longest we have gone in one of these, uh, <laughs> in one of these videos before we've actually gotten the Arduino code editor open, but thank you for bearing with. And I think, I think all of this knowledge will pay off, um, as we, as we do this demo here. So we'll plug that in, come back over to our Arduino IDE, and we'll just write a quick bit of code to demonstrate this. So as you may remember from last week or the week before, the week before that, um, we'll write a little bit of code. If this is, oh, you're over here. If uh, if this is all Greek, if this is the first week you're joining us, I would encourage you to go back and watch a video one of this series, which is how to get the Arduino code editor set up and writing your first bit of code, which is literally the bit of code I'm gonna write right now, which is just to uh, define a pin that our LED is attached to. I'm going to uh, define it as an output. And I honestly, I don't need anything interesting to happen. Uh, I just need to set it to high. I'm gonna set it to five volts and we'll see what happens. Uh, so we're like the LED pin goes high. And I'll make sure that we have selected the correct board. And it's gonna make us save this. Well, of course, when I try and upload it, yes. We'll upload that. Oh, LED pin was not declared. Ah, the error is in capitalization again. This feels good. We're right back in the saddle of writing code and I'm already making typos. I feel great about that. So we come back over to the table here and we see that our green LED is passing about 16 milliamps, which is within a margin of error, right? That's about 20% less than we thought, which probably means in this case that our forward voltage of our, this particular green LED is a little bit higher than we thought. Our resistor is also a, probably a little bit bigger than its nominal value. Um, but there's our demonstration. This is how you pick a resistor to put in series with your LED so that you are only passing the correct amount of current out of your Arduino. We're gonna do another example exactly like this in a sec just to make sure this sticks because this is super important. But first I see we have a few questions in the chat. Um, what's the power source that Jeff has that he can control how much voltage the circuit gets? Ah, yeah, a bench power supply, as Kenneth says. Yeah, um, I will put a link to that bench power supply uh, in the comments or in the, um, <coughs> in the in the comments or the description of this video. Um, or if you want to, um, if you go to my uh, website, which is uh, jeff.glass, you can see down here, um, I did a whole blog post uh, a few months back and not to, to shamelessly plug it, but I think it's a really useful resource. Um, if you go to jeff.glass on the blog, I did a whole post, I'm gonna scroll down a little bit, uh, seven segment displays, yada, yada, yada. Yeah, I did a whole post about setting up an electronics lab and the tools that I like to use to do it, um, including my favorite soldering irons and my favorite multimeters, like here's the multimeter that we've been using tonight and various other things. And somewhere in here, I have a whole thing about bench power supplies and electrical power with some recommendations. You really don't need a, a super expensive fancy one. Um, I This is actually, this is the one I'm, I'm using tonight uh, that's just off camera over there um, that just lets me have a little knob to dial up and down the voltage. Um, you can get a fancier one. If I was going to buy one from scratch today, I'd get one with a, a digital input. This is the one I have at work um, that lets you punch in the actual number of voltage, which is super handy. Um, but again, these things are not horribly expensive. So a, a useful tool if you're going to be doing this kind of experimentation, I think, wouldn't be the first tool I buy. I'd get a multimeter, um, but a useful thing to have. So really good question. Let's see. Uh, let's see. Kenneth says... LEDs are so cheap, throwing them away is a money. Yeah, uh, <laughs> Kenneth gave me a, literally a sack of mixed LEDs from China because they're they're super, super cheap. Kenneth says the microcontroller isn't going to output 5 volts. Oh, that's also true. Yeah, so like we were thinking about high as 5 volts, low as 0 volts, but we're not guaranteed for that high to actually be a full 5 volts or something a little bit lower. 
Um, so we did one example with the green LED. I want to do another example because like how you calculate a resistor for an LED, I think illustrates a lot of important concepts um, and it's something we're going to be doing a lot as we set these things up. So to jump back to our slides for a second here, um, I want to do another example with a different LED, right? So because the forward voltage changes based on the color of your LED, when you change LED colors, you need to think about changing your resistors. So let's do an example with a red LED, right? So we're still looking for about a 20 milliamp forward voltage, um, or a forward current, I should say. But the forward voltage of a red LED, which we can cheat from our chart, is about 2.1 volts. This chart, by the way, is not magic. Google red LED forward voltage, and this answer or this chart will just pop up. I, I, I don't bother to memorize these. You just Google the information you need. Um, so let's figure out what resistor we would put in line with a red LED to limit its current at 5 volts to 20 milliamps. So same equation over here from Ohm's law, V equals IR. So right from our voltage, we have to subtract our 2.1 forward voltage here. Um, so we have V equals 0 0.02, which is our current in amps times our resistance. We move some things around. We get that our resistance is 2.9, right? When we took these two things away over this 0 0.02. And our resistance is going to be about 145 ohms. Um, so in a, in a practical world, probably about 150 ohms. And I realized I didn't grab my 150 ohm resistors, but I should, because we should do this demo too. Thankfully, my filming location is at my workbench. So I have all these things neatly available here. Pull out our 150 ohm resistors. Where are you? Here you go. That is a brown, green, brown resistor in the code we looked up earlier. Let's set those aside. And we'll get this thing wired up. So um, let's unplug this from our power just briefly here. Uh, I'm going to take a red LED out of the bag. It's worth noting that, you know, those forward voltages are approximate. Um, and they do change um, even within a specific color and a specific manufacturer of LED, right? So this red LED from a factory in China might not have exactly the same forward voltage as any of these other red LEDs from the same factory in China. So uh, it's not something you should necessarily count on being fixed. However, for our purposes, you know, within 10, 20% is close enough. We'll plug that into our circuit in the same place that that green LED was. We'll plug our wire back in. Oops, I gotta change the resistor first. Take my 80 ohm resistor out of our circuit that we were using earlier. And I'll put my 150 ohm resistor. Michael says in the various tutorials, the common resistor is listed as 220 ohms. Is that basically a catch-all resistor number? Yeah, so uh, a good reason to use 220 ohms, right? Let's take a look at our, our math that we were just looking at, right? For a red LED, which has the lowest forward voltage of any commonly available LED, a 150 ohm resistor limits you to, at most, about 20 milliamps. So if we go, if we go higher than that value of resistance, we're going to have even less current. So even if we had a red LED with a, a, a really, you know, astonishingly low forward voltage. And even if our resistor was really generous with its spec and had a abnormally, you know, a abnormally low resistance for a 220 ohm resistor, we would still be less than that 20 milliamp value that we want to, you know, that we want to stay under for the sake of not damaging our Arduino. So a 220 is just a nice safe value. Um, it lets you say, you know, put a 220 ohm resistor in line with your LED and then whatever, you know, knockoff resistor and whatever LED you throw on there, you're pretty safe. Um, so let's plug this resistor in to our breadboard here. Oops, let's get you guys a view of that and not just the top of my head. Plug that resistor in. We plug our ammeter back in. We'll turn that back on and we'll plug. Why are you beeping at me? turn plug this back in and we have a little red LED turn on and we see again we're pulling about 16 milliamps so um, it could be that the voltage is sagging could be that the resistors are out of spec in fact we can see if the voltage coming out of um, coming out of the Arduino is indeed 5 volts or if it's something else by using our voltmeter which I need to zoom out so we can see there we go get in there voltmeter so I'm going to take the probes of my voltmeter and I'm going to put them, uh, I'm going to put them between the uh, pin of the Arduino here and the grounded point of our Arduino. So I'm going to hook up to here where the voltage comes in. There we go. And where else can I hook up? I can hook up to where we return from our 
meter here. And I see I'm really only getting about 4.4 volts instead of the full 5 volts that we sort of think about as being our, our high voltage. Um, so that accounts a little bit for why our current is a little bit less. It's because our voltage is a little bit less. Thanks, Kenneth. I didn't know that. All right, so just, that's just another example of how you would select a resistor to put in line with an LED. So when you hook it up to your Arduino, you don't smoke the thing. Um, you go through this math, you use this Ohm's law, this V equals I times R equation. You subtract the forward voltage of your LED, you work all the math out, and that tells you how big a resistor to use. Um, so um, that for, you know, these sort of low currents, 20 milliamps is a pretty low current model, that is basically all the math that you need to worry about for selecting resistors. But I want to do a slightly higher current example to show you one more gotcha. So let's take uh, not our little, you know, five millimeter, uh, you know, comes in the hobby kit LED. I'm going to use for this example uh, what I purchased as a three watt, quote unquote, LED star. Um, which is one of these. I have a, an LED diode right in the middle of this chip here. You can see it's a 7040 Lux Drive model, um, and it's sitting in this uh, this bit of circuit board that's actually made out of aluminum, and that's to help suck heat away from this LED, because as we uh, put more and more current through it, we'll see it does get quite hot. So this is uh, this is the point when my wife Mary will uh, be standing by with a fire extinguisher. Um, or actually, I, I have a fire extinguisher on my wall just here. So if all of a sudden you see me dive out of frame to, to frame left, uh, you'll know something's gone horribly wrong. So this was sold to me, you know, not as a, you know, a something something milliamp LED star, but as a three watt LED star. Um, so how much current uh, should I put through it? Well, let's figure that out. So here's our circuit that we're going to use. I'm going to say we're going to power this off of 5 volts. Uh, I'm not going to power it directly from the Arduino. I'm going to use that bench power supply again. Um, but let's say that 5 volts, for whatever reason, is the, the voltage that I have available. So um, assuming I'm driving this 3-watt LED star from 5 volts, uh, what resistor should I use? Well, we can do a little bit of math. And we're going to make use of an equation that we saw earlier, which is that power equals current times voltage. Remember way back we defined what a watt is. A watt is one amp times one volt. So we have this equation P equals I times V that we can use to work out the current that we should allow through our LED. So in this case, power is three watts, or at least I'm trusting the manufacturer that I can put three watts out of this thing, equals current times. And here we have this same situation where we're taking our system voltage and we're subtracting the forward voltage of our LED. For a white LED, there's kind of a wide range, somewhere between 3.1 and 3.7 volts, depending on the type of white LED that it is. Um, if I assume that that forward voltage is low, that means I'm going to calculate, you know, the highest possible current. And that means that my resistor is going to be sized for that high current. And that's, that's sort of a safe way of sizing that resistor. So if I move these things around here, I get that my current is equal to 3 over this 1.9 figure, or that the current that I'm going to end up shoving through this thing is 1.5 amps, or about uh, 70 times as big as we've been pushing out of our Arduino, um, 50 times as big as we can safely push out of our Arduino. So we're certainly not going to be powering this thing directly off of an Arduino pin. Um, but to get this thing to light up with its full 3 watts of power output, I'm going to push about an amp and a half through it. So now that we have our current, uh, I can use that to figure out the size of resistor that I would put in line. Um, so, right, so now I have my five volts. I am, this value of resistor here is what I'm gonna try and solve for. I know I'm gonna be pushing 1.57 amps or so through this circuit. So now we can use our old familiar Ohm's law, V equals IR, right? V, once again, our system voltage minus our forward voltage. Our current we now know is 1.57 and times our resistance. We move some things around and we get our resistance is 1.9 over 1.57, or our resistance is about, about 1.2 ohms. Um, so in this circuit, if I take five volts and I put a 1.2 ohm resistor in line and an LED, any LED with a forward voltage of about 3.1 volts, I'm going to need a resistor about 1.2 ohms to allow 1.57 amps to flow through so that three watts come out of the LED. Make sense? Let me say that all one more time and then we'll do the burn nation demo in person, right? So here's what I did. I took the known power, the wattage of the LED, and the voltage that I decided I was going to apply. I used those to solve for the total current that would be flowing through my system. And once I knew my current and my voltage that I already decided, I could use that to solve for the resistor. So these two equations put together, V equals IR, 
and P equals IV, when I put them together, I can solve for this resistance. Yeah? So, <laughs> let's, uh, let's throw the gotcha in there, right? So, I need about a 1.2 ohm resistor uh, to, uh, to limit this current to the, um, to the 1.5 amps that I'm going to push through this thing. But uh, that resistor, right, is, uh, is limiting the current. It's also got current flowing through it and is going to release some power just like anything that has current flowing through it does. How much power is that resistor going to release? We know the LED is going to release about 3 watts because that's we decided the current based on that. But how about that resistor? Well, we can use that first formula again, that P equals IV formula, to figure out how much power the resistor releases, right? So... Um, Let's see. Oh, I, <laughs> I've written things a little bit backwards here and let me just correct them. What I should have written. Oh, these are images. <laughs> um, by using, so, uh, oh no, we can, we'll be fine. Um, let's see, what have I done here? Big old typo. Um, we can use this P equals I V formula here. Let's just, we'll do the math on the table because that'll be easier to edit in the slides. Let's see here. So we said our resistance was going to be about 1.2 ohms, and we knew our current is about 1.57 amps. And what we're looking for is power. We know our voltage is five volts. So uh, we know our total voltage is five volts, um, but the individual voltage, oh, that's what I've done. Yes, I've just typoed here, yes, yes, yes. So um, the individual voltage across our LED, we said is gonna be about five volts minus 3.1 volts or about 1.9 volts. So our total power is P equals IV. Our power is going to be our current, 1.57 volts, times just the voltage that's remaining to go across this resistor, right? So we're, we're subtracting out this 3.1 volts that's across the LED. We're left with this 1.9 volts that's going to be across the resistor. And we multiply those things together. The results are actually worse than what I had in the slides. I'm going to use my magic Google calculator here to get that our total wattage is about 2.98 watts which is a not inconsiderable amount of power. That's about as much power as our, um, our electron light bulb was releasing earlier. That's a scorching resistor. Um, and uh, unfortunately, it's more power than you can safely release from a little nickel resistor like these guys. When you get them in a pack, you know, or in your starter kit, you often see them as just like, oh, it's a resistor. When you buy them, you buy a resistor with a given power rating. This, I think, is a quarter watt resistor. It's about the size of, you know, half of a fingertip. Um, you can go bigger and smaller from there. I think I have in here, ah, uh, yeah, some of these little guys we were looking at earlier these little grain or rice size ones, that's an eighth watt resistor. That means if I release any more than a quarter watt or an eighth of a watt from these size of resistors, they will start to smoke, catch on fire, die. Depends how much current you put through them, how fast. But they are not rated to, to release any more power than that. And we just figured out that when I build this circuit here in a second, I'm going to need that 1.2 ohm resistor to be able to release about three watts of power. So these are not going to be the right tool for the job. Instead, I'm going to use something like these guys. This is a power resistor. I'll get one that's not in the circuit here. And um, it's actually made out of some wire and a bit of concrete that's been cast around that bit of wire um, to create the resistance that I need. Um, you can see this one is rated for 5 watts and is a 2.2 ohm resistor. Um, they get bigger from here. So this is a you know, 5 watt resistor. You can get 10 watts and 20 watts. When you get up to about 50 and 100 watts, you start to see them in metal cases with big fins coming off the side. You can blow a fan across to remove more heat from them. Um, you can get into water-cooled resistors. Like, you can get resistors as big as you want if you want to pay for them. Um, but, uh, you know, now that we're, we're into this higher power LED example, it's worth thinking about how much power is my resistor going to release so you don't accidentally smoke up your resistor. I guess we could smoke up a resistor. That'd be kind of fun. Um, let me show you the working demo first and then we'll catch more things on fire. So what I've worked up here, you may have seen earlier, is I have my three watt LED that we want to put about an amp and a half through. And I've got, uh, because these are the power resistors I had in stock, I've taken two of these 2.2 ohm resistors and put them in parallel. 
right? So we remember from earlier, if I put two identical resistors in parallel, the equivalent resistance is half of the individual resistor. So this is about a 1.1 ohm resistor, more or less. The tolerances on, um, on power resistors tend to be really crummy, because you can imagine like casting concrete is not necessarily a terribly precise process. So this could be, I guess we can measure it. We have the tools. Let's, uh, let's get our meter out and see what the resistance of that thing actually is. Put this in resistance mode. Put our probes across it, and we'll see total resistance there. 1.4 ohms. So a little bit above the 1.2 ohms we were looking for, but that's fine. I think we'll be just fine with that. Um, before I possibly burn myself, because if I do, that'll probably be, um, need a little bit of a break to go address that. Let me take some questions from the, from the chat really quick. Let's see what's popping up here. <laughs> Let's see. I won't leave you tanging too long. We're going to, well, I'll burn myself in just a second here. Um, Megan asked, uh, topic I'm curious about kit with a single RGB LED. Yeah, working with RGB LEDs is a, is a a good topic we should certainly look at. I see Kenneth has provided you some answers. Um, Kenneth notes that for things like a three watt LED, it will really only be three watts continuous if it's cooled. Yeah, you will see in just a second here when I put the proper amount of amperage through this, it's gonna get really smoking hot. If I wanted to put one and a half amps through this thing for a long time, I would need a heat sink of some kind, a big block of metal to keep this thing cool. Michael says his kit came with a PDF that's about 250 pages of tutorials and circuit diagrams. That's super cool. Michael, you should certainly share that with people and you should also share that with me because I would love to find a way to share that because that's like a super useful, um, a super useful uh, document to have. P.F. Janky says, are the forward voltages similar for older versus newer LED tech? Can't remember which types I've heard about. Phosphate, gallium, I think, are they the same and can you spot the difference? Yeah, there are many, many different types of LED um, chemistries. Um, and technologies. And in fact, the white LEDs, not to get off on too much of a tangent, but there are many different kinds of white LED. Most of them are some kind of either blue or ultraviolet LED with a phosphor coating over the top. So the LED, and Kenneth, correct me where I'm straying here, the, the light that's actually coming out of the LED um, will illuminate that phosphor, which will then glow itself with a broader spectrum of light than the LED itself would actually uh, emit. Um, so Forward voltages do vary, um, but for a generic red, green, blue, yellow LED, um, they will be about what you can sort of Google online. If you're buying an LED product, it will often say, you know, uh, like if you bought a package of 100 red LEDs from Amazon, it would probably say forward voltage 2.1 volts, and you can be reasonably confident that that's about right, if that makes sense. All right, let's get to the burning. What are we going to want to see? Because I'm only going to want to do this a couple times, uh, or it's going to get screaming hot on me. Um, let's do a current measurement. So let me come back to the table here. We'll hook up our, we'll zoom that out a little bit. See my beer is slowly creeping further and further into shot as we go. Bring my power supply over here. Ah, so we said earlier um, that for small LEDs, you can tell which is the anode, which is the cathode by the longer leg. On these larger LEDs, these star LEDs, you actually get little plus and minus markings on the individual solder pads. So that's how I knew which was positive and negative on here. All right, zoom that back out. We'll hook up the positive side of our supply to the positive, uh, the plus pad on this LED. I'm going to hook up the negative side so that we're going through our, uh, through our ammeter here. Let's set that up for amps. I'm just going to beep at me until I plug that in correctly. Um, and turn my voltage on my power supply way down and we'll fire this thing up. So when we put, uh, we should probably do a voltmeter here too. That's been the theme of the night. There's our voltmeter. So you can see what voltages are at when I, uh, when I fire this thing up. Put our voltmeter across. I'm gonna put one end, basically attached to each end of the power supply. Attach that there. All right, get that out of the way so we can see the burnination. This is actually hovering a little bit off of the tabletop because of the action of these uh, clips, and I don't hate that because um, this is just a vinyl surface, so I don't know how well it would do with heat. All right, so power supply is on, registering about 0.7 volts here. Let's uh, let's get this thing turned on. So, right, so no light coming out of the LED yet, right, because we're below that forward voltage. Slowly dialing it up, slowly dialing it up, 2 volts. Aha, starting to see just a little bit of light there. 
and no, this is not registering any current yet, or 0.001, 1 milliamp of current so far at 2.4 volts. But watch what happens as I increase toward that 5 volt target. All right? Now we're at 2.8 volts, and I've got 80 milliamps. 3.5 volts, I've got half an amp. As I increase toward 5 volts, I've got about 1.7 amps, just about on the nose. This thing, I don't know how easy it is to tell on camera, it is screaming bright. It's, it's hard to look. You can probably see the difference on my face as I light it up. Yeah, that's kind of fun. Maybe I need up lights for my next stream. So as I get to that 5 volt figure, I get about 1.57 volts, which tells me that it's dissipating about the 3 watts that I know it's spec for. Now let's let's try not to kill ourselves here, but I'm just going to see how... Whew! That is already... That's already, I would say, 110 degrees, 120 degrees. So as Ken has said earlier, if I was going to build a light fixture out of this, I would need some way of keeping that cool in a more durable way. But that's at least how you would, you know, given a wattage spec for an LED, we now know how to spec the resistor to drive it from. We also know, given a current limit for an LED, we know how to pick that resistor and how to drive it from there, right? Two sort of the more common things you might do um, when, you're, when you're choosing to drive resistors from a microcontroller circuit. Chris says I have the ability to do temp with my meter. I do. I don't have the probes handy that do the temperature measurement um, with this particular multimeter. They're up in a up in a bin somewhere. We'll do. I, I think it would make sense to do a more um, a more thorough look at driving LEDs and heat management at some point. We might do it next week as part of our look at transistors and FETs. We may not get there, um, but uh, if I can find the ability to measure temperature at that point, that would be a fun thing to do. All right, we've looked at so much this evening, we have just a little bit more to look at. Oh, questions? <laughs> I put this slide in here to remember to be asked for questions, but you guys have been doing like a great job of asking questions as we go along. Um, anything else as we're thinking about hooking up LEDs to power, uh, hooking up resistors to voltages, how current and power and resistance and voltage interact? We've covered a heck of a lot of ground. I should say, because I don't think I said it at the top of the night, and I'm so sorry if I didn't, the slides from tonight's presentation and all of the circuit diagrams that are in them are on my website here, jeff.glass slash electronics bash. That page has all of the information from all the streams we do. You can go and open the slides, and if I ever go back and change them or update them, it's all updated there. They also have the circuit diagram and the code examples for the seven segment examples that we're going to do in a second here. So I'm sorry I didn't mention that at the beginning, but if you want to follow along with the slides or go back and reference something later, they will always be on that website. There's also a link to that website in the description of this stream. Chris says it's a long 90 minutes. Yeah, I'm doing a metric 90 tonight. Um, it's a little bit longer than an American 90. Need to hop out or like, got a game across the stream? Yeah, my pleasure, man. Thanks. I'm so glad you could stop by. We do these every Sunday night at 7 p.m. Central. Um, next week, I think I've already mentioned, we're going to talk about uh, driving transistors and FETs and relays. We're going to do some more high-powered stuff. And uh, since I didn't burn myself or blow anything up tonight, I guess I blew up one thing. We'll, uh, we'll see if we can blow something up next week. Hmm. Megan says, is there a resource for checking standard voltages for the various other components of our kits? Have a good night, man. Um, Megan, I'm not sure exactly what you mean by that question. Can you list some of the components you're thinking of and we can we can dive into that? Hmm. Palmer says, are LEDs in parallel or series treated the same as resistors? Ah, good question. Let's talk a little bit about LEDs in parallel. Let me clear off a little space on my bench here while Megan's thinking of some examples, because um, I'm going to need to scribble some, scribble some things down for this question, because um, it's a good one. All right, let's get a fresh piece of paper here. So, Palmer... I think you're thinking about, let's come back to the table. There we go. You're thinking about a situation, I'm glad you asked this because it's, it's not in the slides, but it's something I, I wish definitely should talk about. You're talking about a situation in which we have, uh, let's say a positive voltage, uh, and we have say, let's do two LEDs in parallel. Um, this is not necessarily how you would necessarily choose to wire something, but let's say that this is what our goal is. Um, how would you put our ground down here? How would you um, how would you wire this up? How would you choose to um, implement this as a circuit? Um, well, the if you're choosing LEDs specifically, the safest thing to do, um, the way to get these powered in a way that you can predict their behavior, is to put an individual resistor attached to each LED, 
and then attach those to ground. I should also say, I've been putting the resistors on the upstream side of the LEDs this whole night by, you know, just habit. You could put them on the downstream side of the LED, the circuit doesn't really care. Um, for this example, right, the voltage fr from this point, from this resistor to this point on the other side of the LED is the same as our positive input voltage. So this circuit is basically the same thing we've been dealing with all night. And this circuit is the same thing we've been dealing with all night. So we can use our same V equals IR equation to do the math literally exactly as we have been doing all evening. Um, let's do, um, let's put this to numbers, right? So um, I'm just gonna reuse some numbers that we came up with earlier. Let's say this is a red LED uh, and it has a forward voltage of 2.1 volts. Uh, that led us to, uh, let's say this is our 5 volt power supply, just to make up some numbers to give us something to work with. Um, from V equals IR, we did this math already. We said that our resistance would want to be about 145 ohms, right? If these are both red LEDs, well, when I do this math over here, I still have 5 volts across this whole contraption. I still have, if this is a red LED, I still have a forward voltage of 2.1 volts. Right? So if I do my same math, I'm going to come out that this resistor should also be 145 ohms. So if I put 145 ohm resistor here, I know that the current through here is going to be my 20 milliamps that I want. I know that my current through here is going to be the 20 milliamps that I want. And so this circuit will work just fine. This sort of leads us to a point we haven't talked about though, right? I said I have 20 milliamps flowing through this side. I have 20 milliamps flowing through this side of the other circuit, if you will, which means I have 40 milliamps flowing through this part of the circuit right here. Um, and that is due to something called Kirchhoff's current law. You don't need to remember the name of that law. It's really intuitive. People make a big deal about this, but all it says is when you have currents flowing into and out of a junction point in your circuit, like you do here, the sum of the currents flowing in has to equal the sum of the currents flowing flowing out. I have 20 milliamps now flowing through this part of my circuit, right? Because I put five volts across it and I size my resistor so I'd have 20 milliamps. I have 20 milliamps flowing through this side of my circuit because I picked the resistor so that, that would be true. If I have 20 milliamps flowing out this way and 20 milliamps flowing out this way, I have 40 milliamps flowing in this way, right? Um, similarly, I have 40 milliamps flowing out my ground connection down here, right? Because I have 20 milliamps coming into this junction. I have 20 milliamps coming into this junction, so I must have 40 milliamps flowing out. Kirchhoff's current law, people make it like seem like it's a fancy thing. It just says that when you have things flowing into a junction, you have the same things flowing out. Does that sort of make sense? So that's how I would hook up um, LEDs in parallel. Uh, let's, just because we're down a bit of a rabbit hole, and uh, we're not quite to um, a metric 90 minutes yet, let's just talk briefly about LEDs in series. Right, let's say I have three LEDs wired in series, like that. Let's say that they're all red LEDs, again, so they have the same forward voltage of about 2.1 volts. We can treat this whole situation, right, this is 2.1 volts, 2.1 volts, and 2.1 volts as our forward voltage. I can treat this whole situation kind of like one diode with a forward voltage of their sum of 6.2 volts, right? So let's say I wanted to have um, because the, the current through all of these is going to be the same, right? Because current can only really flow one way through our circuit. Let's assume I'm going to put a resistor up here. Um, I only want 20 milliamps to throw through this LED or it's going to blow up. And 20 milliamps here and 20 milliamps here. I really only want 20 milliamps flowing through this circuit as a whole. So now I have a one diode with a forward voltage of 6.2 volts. I have my 20 milliamp forward current. And for a given supply voltage... I can do my V equals IR math again and figure out what this resistor would be. Now you may have noticed I have a five volt supply here. I have a 6.2 volt forward voltage, which means even if this resistor is zero, it's likely that no current is going to flow. It's possible. And when we saw that below our forward voltage, sometimes a little bit of current would flow, but this would be a situation where I probably would need to bump up this forward voltage, uh, sorry, this supply voltage to something above the total forward voltage of our LEDs. Maybe this becomes nine volts or 12 volts or something like that. Um, but once we chose that, right, let's say we chose this as 12 volts, we can once again do our V equals IR math to figure out what this resistor would wanna be. Make sense? Let's see what's happening in chat in the meantime. Um, Megan says, was wondering about figuring out what resistors I need for other components. Ah, yes, good question. Seven segment displays, IR receiver. We're gonna do segment displays tonight, I think. Wow, we're gonna go long tonight, but I think that's okay. 
right? I mean, people can leave. People don't feel pressure to stay, but I'm still here. I still have beer. We're going to do segment displays tonight. At least we're going to get them started. Mm. Um, and we'll see how we treat them. IR receivers, we probably won't get into. Um, but if you Google IR receiver circuit, you will probably find some with some standard resistances in line with them. Um, much like Michael says, like, you know, the, the circuits often say, like, put a 220 ohm resistor in line with it because it's a safe value. There are there are safe values for some of the other ones. Um, I just don't know what they are off the top of my head, if that sort of makes sense. Good questions. Further questions? LEDs in series, LEDs in parallel. Ooh, let's go back to our parallel LED example for one more second before we do segment displays, um, which is um, I did an example with two red LEDs in parallel to each other, but there's no reason why these have to necessarily be the same color of LED. I me put, and I've sort of scribbled all over everything here, I could put another LED and resistor out here. And this could be a green LED from earlier, right? But because I still have five volts across it, let's say I wanna size this to be 20 milliamps as well, right? I can do the same V equals IR math and figure out what this resistor is. And it would look just like our example from earlier where we figured out this wants to be about 80 ohms. In that case, if I had 20 milliamps flowing across this LED and 20 milliamps here and 20 milliamps here, I'd have 60 milliamps fed in through my whole circuit and so on. Sure you don't want to make LED displays their own circuit? Ah, Kenneth, I want to do, I'm not going to do a, a super long LED display example, um, but I do, I, I did say I was going to get to it tonight. And so because it ties into powering LEDs, I think it'll be a nice, a nice segue. It is also going to let us write a little bit of code, which we haven't done a ton of tonight, um, which I think will be a nice way to cap off tonight. Um, I know we're going long. Um, maybe, I, and honestly, um, we're going to have to revisit seven segment displays next week when we talk about transistors, because those are going to kind of fill out the way we control things. Yeah, so I'm going to keep going. I know we're going long, but I, I really want to get to this because people have been requesting seven segment displays for a while. So let's do it right now. Here we go. Seven segment displays. You probably have seen these uh, somewhere in your life. Um, these little displays that have, that form numbers and digits that have seven individual segments on them. Um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, that make up a number. Um, make seven segment displays their own segment. Oh, it was a pun! Kenneth, it was an LED pun. I missed the LED pun. Oh, I'm gonna have more water. <laughs> Oof, I'm disappointed in myself. I'll go back to talking about circuits now. Um, seven segment displays, so-called because they have seven LED segments that make up a number. They also have an eighth connection for this decimal point. Some of them have this, some of them don't, but they're called seven segment displays. And I'm a seven segment plus dot displays, often with eight connections. Um, they come in a variety of flavors. Um, the ones we're working with tonight have this single digit. Yeah, you may also have ones in your kit that have two or four digits, which will work similarly, but uh, for the conclusion of how to work with those, we're gonna need some of the knowledge from next week. So for today, I'm gonna show you how to wire up a single digit seven segment display. So what's going on inside of these seven segment displays? I have basically eight individual LEDs here. Um, one LED for the top segment, one for the top right, one for the top, for the bottom right, and so on. But I only have 10 connections on the back. And if each of these seven segments plus dot were broken out individually, you'd expect I'd have two times eight, 16 different connections. So what's actually going on inside of here? Here's essentially what's going on. There's two different ways that these things can be wired, but essentially you either have, in the case of a common cathode display, you have all of the cathodes of the LED, or the negative sides all tied together, and then you get an individual connection point for all of the anodes, all the positive sides, right? So you would connect your ground, your negative side to in one place, and then you would connect individual high side connections to the positive sides of all your LEDs. For a common anode, connection uh, seven segment display, things are exactly the other way around. Here's what the inside of one of those looks like. You have this common positive connection, and then you would individually connect the downstream side, the, the cathode side, the negative side of each LEDs to ground when you wanted them to turn on, if that makes sense. So for tonight, this is the flavor I'm going to be working with, this common anode side. The pieces that come with your kit may be common cathode or common anode, and if they are, the changes that you have to make to your design are actually relatively minimal, um, but we'll get to them in a sec. But just know that I'm using a common anode display, and you will have to sort of reverse a few things if, you're, if you find that in your kit you have this common cathode display. Um, 
I should say, so the seven segment displays have been around for quite a while um, bef before there were sort of LEDs in common use. And each of the segments have these sort of common names for which segments are called what. You can see this top segment here is called the A segment. The top right here is the B segment, C, D, E, F, G, and then the dot. Um, these are sort of for many displays, how those uh, segments are wired up to the external connections, whether they are um, common cathode or common anode, you often see that like this uh, bottom left connection here connects to the E segment and then D, and then you have one of your common points of connection, whether that's a common cathode or a common anode, you know, C dot. This is not universal by any stretch. So this things may go haywire, but for a, I, the majority, many displays, this is tends to be the pinout. So this may be a place to get you started. Um, so if we were to look at um, the individual LEDs that make up these segments, how they would be wired, you'd have, uh, you know, pins three and eight, if we count around counterclockwise here, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Three and eight here, one, two, three, and eight are connected to this common point. And then on the uh, cathode side, say pin one, pin one down here is connected to the E segment. Pin two is connected to the D segment. So these two diagrams are saying the same thing. Um, one or the other may be helpful as you're getting things wired up. Megan says, how do we tell which type we have? What a good question. I'll show you. Um, so what I'm going to do is I have, I have a, a seven segment display already wired into an Arduino that we'll use later, but I can use this one to do our demo with. Um, I'm going to take a source of five volt power. In my case, I'm gonna use my power supply. You could use the five volts and ground supplies uh, on your Arduino for this purpose as well. Turn that on and dial it down to five volts from our skin melting LED adventure that we had a moment ago. Um, and I'll show you how to determine what kind you have. I'm gonna take a 1K resistor. I'm gonna attach it to uh, the positive lead of my power supply, so, right? So for me, this is clipping this into one of these clip leads. For you, if this you're using an Arduino, this could be, you know, wiring this into, just plugging this into your uh, five volt connection pin here on your Arduino, right? And I'm choosing 1K because it's a, a very, it's a, a, a decently large resistor for the kinds of LEDs we're working with, right? If we work through the math of how much current can flow across, well, I mean, we can, we can do this <laughs> if we wanted to, how much current can flow across of a 1K resistor um, uh, at five volts. It's just a few milliamps, two or three milliamps. Um, I guess I guess five milliamps really, but once you put an LED in line with a forward voltage of about two volts, you get about three milliamps. And three milliamps is a safe amount of power um, for just about any of these. How much power you can actually put out of one of these segments may vary based on your display. I'd be hesitant to put more than about 20 milliamps out of it. And for safety, I've actually dialed mine down to about five milliamps per segment for, for the sake of safety. Um, so by choosing a resistor that's far, far larger than I need to, to give me that safe level of current, I know that sort of whatever I do, there's no danger of me overheating and blowing out an LED. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to take the uh, ground side of my power connection, right, from my power supply or my Arduino. I'm gonna hook it up to one of those center common pins there, pin three or pin eight, these center ones um, hooked up, say, right there. And then I'm going to take my resistor and I'm going to drag it across the other pins and see if anything happens. Looks like not. Right? So if that happens, I'm going to reverse my connections. I'm going to take my positive connection, my five volts, and hook it up to one of those center pins. I'm gonna take my resistor and hook it up to my negative supply, and I'm going to drag that across the pins. Aha! You see that there? I have light. So that tells me that my common point here, that this is connected to, my common point is my anode. My common is positive, and that these individual pins are the negative connections. Right? This feels uh, a little bit strange to do sometimes just to drag wires across each other, but that's why I choose such a big resistor, right? I know I really can't damage anything. Ken says you can also look at the data sheet if you have one. Yeah, it's true. If, um, if you're working from a getting started with Arduino kit, you may or may not have a data sheet. But if you're buying the parts new, then you could, you could look it up on the data sheet and it would tell you. So, but that's a really easy way to tell, you know, if this common connection is positive or negative. And in my case, it's positive. So now that we know which kind we have, we can get to wiring it up. 
Um, and before we do, I want to just I want to make a little point for those who've been playing along so far. Um, for all of the driving LED circuits that I've been talking about driving from LEDs uh, from the Arduino so far, we've been doing what we see on the left here, um, where we have a digital pin, resistor LED, and ground, right? The current flows out of the digital pin through the LED and into ground. But on the Arduino, it's just as valid to say I would have current flowing out of a 5 volt source through a resistor and LED and into the digital pin. The digital pin can either source current in the case of this uh, driving it by the uh, by the positive side of the LED, or it can sync current, right? When you drive that pin low, in this case D2, when I take the pin 2 to 0 volts, it can actually absorb a small amount of current as well. It can take current in, usually up to that same 20 milliamp limit that we've been using as our a sort of limiting factor this whole time, uh, both for the Arduino and the LEDs, frankly. Um, so this, because of the configuration that my seven segment display is, this is the configuration I'm going to be using tonight. I just wanted to mention that this is a perfectly valid way to drive LEDs that we just haven't used before. Um, so um, for the purposes of our demo tonight, I'm going to be driving each of these segments from five volts, and I'm going to be driving them at uh, about three milliamps. Um, these are, you know, we're an unknown seven segment display that I just pulled out of my junk box. I don't know how old they are or what they can handle, so I picked three milliamps as a really safe value. Um, so here's how I figured out what size the resistor should be in line with them. This should look so familiar by now, right? I just do my V equals IR equation. I don't know why I have this 2.9 fact figure in here. I must have measured the uh, the forward voltage of these segments earlier. That seems wrong to me, but anyway. Um, assuming the forward voltage is 2.9, we can work through the math and find that our resistance should be about 966 ohms. So in my case, I just threw 1K resistors into my circuit anyway, right? So that's going to make sure when I put 5 volts across this resistor and one of these segments, no more than about 3 milliamps will flow. That seems pretty safe. So the circuit we're going to use is this one. This is in the slides. The slides are linked below. This circuit is also on the website, jeff.clash slash uh, electronics bash. So no need to memorize it now. Just some things I want to point out so you get the gist of it, right? Um, this is my seven segment display down here. I have my common pin here, my center one hooked up to five volts. And then I have each of my eight individual segments, right? My seven segments plus my dot connected through a resistor and then back to individual digital pins, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, right? So when I when I have current flow, if I were to take one of these digital pins low, um, I would have current flowing from my five volts into my common pin, out through one of, through one of the segment LEDs, through the resistor, and then down into the digital pin. Um, the exact ordering of the uh, the segments in this display is not super critical. So when if you're playing with this at home, get your segments wired up, and we can correct for which is connected to which segment in code. Um, Kenneth says, real quick before we dive into the code, um, even if it comes in a kit and they don't give you the specs, the part number is printed on the bottom side of your module. Ooh, it should be true. Oh yeah, it should, look at that. Let's see here. This seven segment display is a UA5641R11RRS. So if someone wants to Google that <laughs> and tell me what the current limit should actually be, they're welcome to. I chose three milliamps as a pretty uh, a pretty safe figure. <laughs> but thanks, Kenneth. Yeah, looking at data sheets is a good way to figure out what's going on in your circuit here for sure. Um, let's see here. Is this where we dive into the code? It is. Oh, we're to the code. Those who've been hanging around all night for the code demo, you're in luck. It is time. So let's take a quick look at... Uh, Let's see. Oh, Michael says mine is common ground. How would the wiring be different? Yeah, I will. Sh I will certainly show you. I wonder if I have a segment available. I don't think I have the diagram available, but the gist of it is this. Um, the only change is that this common point, instead of being tied to five volts, is going to be tied to ground. There'll be some code changes as well, but uh, your your common point here, your center pin, is going to be tied instead of five volts. You'll tie it to one of your ground pins. So then your current flow will be when we turn these digital pins high, current will flow from a digital pin through the resistor, through the LED, and then back to ground. So that's the only wiring change you'll need to make. The code we're about to look at is uh, written for, for this style, but I'll try and point out as we go where you'd have to make changes um, to accommodate uh, the common cathode style of display. Um, so if you're playing along at home, uh, we are going to start looking at our first bit of code. On the website, this is the seven-segment manual demo. And I should point out, because I, I confused somebody the other night, if you're on the website, 
um, you, you're, you look at all the episodes, you click on code and circuit diagrams, and then to find the code for these actual examples, I've hidden it inside of these showed code buttons, so it's not taking up all this room on the screen um, from the beginning. So click on show code and it will pop open. So we're gonna do this seven segment manual control demo to start. So let's do a quick stroll through this code, those of you who are still hanging out with us. So, um, this is this is not the way, by the way, that I recommend that I recommend that you write this code. This is a place to start, and we're gonna build from here. Um, so what I've done to start with is define integers, we'll call, um, to uh, let us know which segments are connected to which pins of the Arduino. Um, so in my case, segment A is connected to four, segment B is connected to five, segment C is connected to eight, and so on. Um, this was a little bit of trial and error for me because I plugged them in not particularly carefully, um, but you could easily imagine writing a blink sketch that just turns one of those digital pins on and off and say blink pin two, ah, pin two kind of to segment G, okay. Blink pin three, ah, it's kind of to segment, you know, that's pin F and so on until you had this built up for yourself. So your values may not be what my values were, but this is where how my circuit is currently wired. Um, I should say, I can also get out my actual circuit. We can play along as we look at some code. So th this is what my circuit ended up looking like in real life, which is what we've been looking at that, uh, that paper example because it's a little bit, uh, a little bit hard to see on here. Um, but you see we have our, our common connection here back to power and then our eight individual wires going to our segments. So looking back at our code, um, I've defined this pause variable, which we'll use later as, as 500. We're gonna do a delay, you might imagine. We have to delay for 500 milliseconds. Um, so, now that I have my eight output segments defined, uh, I'm going to, of course, configure all of them individually as outputs, as we know, pin mode outputs, and then I'm going to set them all to high. So in the case of my circuit, and this is, uh, this is where your experience may vary if you have a common cathode variation, I'm wiring all these circuits up in this, um, this common anode configuration where I have five volts coming into my display and I need to make my pin low, make my pin zero volts in order to turn them on. So when my pin is high, when my pin is at five volts, the LED is off. So it's a little bit backwards from how we have been thinking about these things, right? Uh, normally we're saying, oh, five volts is on, zero volts is off. In my case, I really want, when I have this pin at five volts, no current is gonna flow, so the LED is gonna be off. If you have a common a uh, cathode display, your segments are going to be on when that, it's going to be, you know, basically in this configuration, your segments are gonna be on when your pin is high and going to be off when your pin is low. So it'll be a lot like the code examples we had been working with. So in my case, I'm going to turn all the segments off to start with by writing them high. If you have the reverse display, you'll turn them all off by writing them low. Um, and then I'm gonna run this loop of code, which is basically gonna individually turn on a segment, right, by, by pulling its, its uh, cathode low, gonna delay for this pause amount of time, half a second in our case, and then turn that segment back high. And then I'm just gonna repeat that for all of my segments. I'm just gonna step through all the segments and see that they all work. So let's, uh, let's plug in the correct Arduino over here. We'll upload our code. And assuming I haven't made an error, I'll have an error error uploading to board, it's just not selected correctly. There we go, port five. Upload, assuming that that does, we'll come back over here and we'll see that we're cycling through our seven segments. So we're individually one at a time turning those digital pins low. And when they're low, the five volts that we have available on the common pin is able to flow through that LED, through a given resistor, and then back to the Arduino, right? So this is a sort of a basic way of driving the individual segments of a seven segment display. But sort of like we talked about last week, this is kind of a cumbersome way to do all of this. I had eight discrete pin mode statements. I had eight digital writes, and then individually I'm going through and turning them on and off one by one. And uh, it's not a super convenient thing to do. Um, so instead I would propose you do something like our next demo, which is gonna be our seven segment uh, demo array code, if you're following along at home with the code from the website, which is gonna do the exact same thing, but in a cleaner way that's gonna lead us to success. So looking at that code real quick, 
Same thing, I'm gonna, I still have to define which pins are attached to uh, which segments of the LED, so that hasn't changed at all. But now I'm gonna define this array. You remember we looked at arrays last time as ways of holding lists of data. Uh, and that's gonna hold in order segment A, segment B, segment C, segment D. So in a way, it's really holding, you know, segment A is four, segment B is five, segment C is eight. So it's really holding four, five, eight, seven, six, in order of those segments. I've also uh, encapsulated the number of pins as this num pin variable that I can make use of later. Right? So that's all the prep we've done up here. But by holding that data in an array, what it allows me to do is instead of doing eight individual pin mode and digital write statements, I can wrap those all up in a for loop like we looked at last time. You remember a for loop loops through, start, starts a variable of our choosing, in this case a variable just called i at a given value, and increments it by this statement until this statement is no longer true. So we're gonna run through this code with i equals zero, i equals one, i equals two, all the way up until i equals seven, when i equals eight, it will not be less than numpins, and we'll, so we'll, we'll be done with that. So for each of the eight values in our array, we're going to make it an output, and we're going to write to it high. So we've basically taken all of this ugly code that we had to write by hand and encapsulated it into this array, which is great because if we needed to add more segments to this array, we could simply, you know, this could be a segment for a hyphen. Maybe we have a segment for an X character. Uh, if we did that and then just adjusted our number of pins, then this setup code would do exactly what we asked it to do without modification, right? So encapsulating that data in a structured array um, is going to allow us to sort of clean up how we are how we are doing this code, right? We've reduced those like 20 lines of code to just these three, right? And we're gonna do a similar thing for our loop function, right? Rather than going through an individually digital write low, pause, digital write high, digital write low, pause, high, um, I'm gonna encapsulate these in another for loop, which similarly counts from zero to seven. I'm gonna write that particular pin low, pause, and write that particular pin high. So when I upload that code, come back to the table, let that upload, and we'll see it's doing the exact same thing except in like, six lines of code that I was doing in like 60 lines of code. So just a little way to use arrays to clean up the action. So now we're individually driving the seven segments or the eight segments really of our seven segment display. It actually looks like my dot might be burnt out. So it might really only be seven segments so far, but that'll be all right. So, so we have the segments wired up and working, good test. And I see we're almost, <laughs> we're almost at 90 minutes of our, <laughs> of our stream. But we just have one more example to go, which is um, how do we make the seven segment display display numbers, right? Because one thing we could do if we wanted to is individually drive the segments of the seven segment display sort of by hand every time we wanted to display a number, but that might not be great. Let me show you what that might look like. So this will be our uh, seven segment digit basic example from the website. Michael says the dot was working before. Yeah, I might have, it's possible I borked something. Um, so our seven segment basic example, just to walk you through it. So we're gonna, our goal here is gonna be actually to display numbers on our seven segment display. Um, so the code much like before, I had to define which segments are connected to which pins. I still have this array of pins in order to hold them all. Um, still eight pins, our delay time is still gonna be 500 milliseconds. Our setup looks basically the same, right? I'm gonna declare uh, all of those pins as an output. And then you'll see I'm calling this turn off all segments function, which is a function that I wrote for myself. Let's skip down to that and see what it does. All it's doing is a separate for loop that for each of those pins writes it to high. So basically doing what I was gonna do inside my setup function here, it's gonna break that out into a separate function. It says, hey, go through all those pins, turn them high. So the in input to that displays at five volts, the pins are at five volts. I don't wanna see any segments on. This is going to allow me to turn off all those segments whenever I want just by calling this function at any point in my code. Uh, if you have a common uh, common cathode display, uh, turning off your segments, of course, would be writing all those pins low as opposed to high in this point. Um, so going back to setup, right, I've made all my pins output and I've turned them all off to start. Um, and then my loop function, also very simple. Um, I'm going to tell it that my largest digit that I'm going to display is 9. And then I'm going to step from zero to nine in this case. 
Um, I'm going to call this display digit function, which I've also written. And then I'm going to pause for, in our case, 500 milliseconds again. So let's go see the muck that is that display digit function. So here's sort of the, the sort of first pass you might think about in terms of like how you would take, in a, take a function that accepts a digit from 0 to 9 and outputs the correct segments onto your 7 segment display. Well, here's a, a decent first pass, right? So I've written this function, is that, you know, void display digit takes an integer that I'm calling num in our case. And when display digit gets called, the first thing it's going to do is turn off all the segments. I, I just want to start from scratch. Um, I could go through and individually turn off the ones that need to be off, but eh, I'm just going to turn everything off and that'll be fine. And now here's the meat and potatoes. Uh, it's going to be a series of if else statements. I can say uh, if my number is equal to zero, then I want to turn on, remember in, in my case on is low, I want to turn on pins 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5 to make the number 0. That's going to be segments A, B, C, D, E, and F, which if we go back to our wiring diagram here, remember I have A, B, C, D, E, F makes a 0 on my screen, right? So I've hard-coded that into my code here. If I feed this function a 0, I want to turn on, I want to turn everything off and then turn back on these six segments, right? If the number is 1, I only want to turn on segments B and C, right? In our diagram, B and C make a 1. If it's a 2, 0, 1, 3, 4, 5 for segments A, B, D, E, G to make a 2. A, B, D, E, G makes a 2 and so on. I did take the time to go through and code these all in by hand. Um, and it does work. So remember, just to start to remind you what my code is going to do, right? I'm going to step the numbers 0 through 9. And for all those numbers, I'm going to display that digit on the 7 segment display. I'm going to wait half a second. So let's upload that and you can appreciate the, the fruits of my labor. And there we go. So now we have our 7 segment display counting from 0 to 9. 0, 1, 2, 3, and that's by individually hard coding which segments uh, should be turned on at each point in that function. Um, so that works. That's a perfectly valid way to write that function. And if this was a more complicated display, that honestly, this is probably the easiest version of this function to write. There's, I want to, I'm going to be clear. When I say this is not the way I'd recommend you write this function, this is absolutely the way I would rec you could start with this function if, just to get a handle on what's happening. But in terms of maintainability of that code, right, having this many um, digital write and you know low and high, it, it's a little bit a little bit cumbersome. I have like a hundred lines of code here just to tell it to write out these 10 segments. It's not a particularly clean way of handling this. Um, so much in the same way that we encapsulated our segment data into an array and that made it easier to work with, I'm going to encapsulate this segment data into an array to clean up this code. So this will be our final example of the night. Um, it's also on the website. It is the seven segment demo array code, if you're following along with us. And I'll show you what we're doing here. Um, in this case, so we the same thing, defining which segments are attached to which pins. We put them in an array. We have eight of them. We have this pause variable. Our setup mode looks pretty much the same. I think I, so I take out my Oh no, did I erase my code? Am I gonna have to write it from scratch? I don't think so. Oh, no, no. sorry, it's my seven segment bytes example. Whew, scared me there. My seven segment bytes example does exist. It's gonna be a whole thing. Um, starts exactly the same way. I define which segments are attached to which pins. I put the pins in an array. Um, I have this shenanigans, which I will get back to in a second, but let's just take a quick look at our setup function, which looks exactly the same. Defines all the pins as outputs and turns them all off. Our loop function actually looks exactly the same as well. It says my largest digit is 9. I'm going to loop through from 0 to 9, display the digit, and pause. Turn off all segments looks exactly the same. And so the only thing that has changed is this display digit function. And this is part of the advantage of encapsulating your process into functions, right? There's no reason, right, in this other, this, this piece of code we were just looking at where I, you know, had handwritten this all out, there's no reason, like, I'm only using this display digit function once in my code. I could have just put all of this code inside of my loop. But by encapsulating it into a function, this display digit function idea, as sort of like a, a, a self-contained command, I can change the implementation of this function, of this command, without changing 
uh, any of my other code, right? All this, this loop to my eyes says, hey, at this point, display a digit. I don't care how you do it in the background, just get that digit displayed and then wait. So I'm welcome to go in and change the implementation of this display digit function later to make it work better. So by encapsulating that idea into a function, I give myself the ability to change things. And here's how I've changed them. So what I've done is instead of handwriting out uh, individual digital write commands for each, uh, each digit, I have encapsulated that data into these bytes. We haven't talked a ton about bits and bytes. I think we did a couple weeks ago, but um, to, to put it very simply, a bit is a zero or a one, a true or false, an on or an off, and a byte is simply eight bits in a row. Um, so in this case, I have various bytes here, and we'll get to what they mean in a sec, but this byte has eight bits, all of which are either zero or one. This one happens to be zero, 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 one, 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 one. This one is zero, 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 one, one, zero, right? These are just uh, examples of bytes. Um, and I have chosen that the bits in this byte represent the segments in the following order. Dot GFECDBA. Oops, CDBA. Nope, DCBA. <laughs> um, and so I'm going to encode the information of what segments should be on for each digit into these bytes like so. In my zero number, I said I wanted segments A, B, C, D, E, and F to be on. And so if I encode those such that a one means on and a zero means off, that means my digit zero byte is going to look like this. The dot should be off, the uh, G should be off, and F, E, D, C, B, A should be on. For my ones digit, if I want to display a one, only segments B and C need to be on. So I have dot is off, G is off, uh, F, E, D are off, B and C are on, and then A is off, and so on. So this data here, these 10 lines of code, are basically encapsulating all of the information from these digital write commands, right? I've basically just taken all of that data and I've chosen to write it in this way, um, where I've wrapped them all up into a byte. Why choose to write it in a byte instead of in an array? Well, honestly, it's partly because it's handy that there are eight segments and there are eight bits in one byte. Um, and so this is a really natural way to encapsulate data. If I had had 10 or 11 segments, I maybe would have encoded it into one byte and part of another byte. Um, you could also encode this data into an array, but a, a, a byte is a really, a handy way to encode it when things are divisible by eight, if that makes sense. And I'll, I'll show you why that's useful, right? So are we following along so far how these bytes encode encode the digit data, right? How these ones and zeros correspond to the segments in that display that are on or off for each of these digits, right? So with that data in hand, here's what my display digit function looks like. You'll remember that in my other bit of code, it was about 80 lines of digital write commands. But in this bit of code, here's all it does display digit. Turn off everything. Everything turns off. Just get it all off, right? And then it says, uh, if num is between zero and nine, this check is probably not necessary, but it seemed like a decent thing to check at this point in my code. I could have done it for the other code too, right? If the number is but between zero and nine, then uh, for uh, inside this for loop, I'm going to step from zero to seven. Again, I'm going to go over all of my eight pins. And if uh, I'm going to use this new function called bit read, which reads a single bit from a variable in the position given by this number. So, uh, if uh, so, what this what this loop is going to say is I'm going to step this through from zero to nine, right? If bit zero of this number is one, turn that pin on. If bit one of this number is one, turn that pin on. If bit two is on, right? I'm basically doing what I said I would do. I'm going to translate this series of ones and zeros. If it's one, that segment should be on. If it's zero, that segment should be off. Now, how do we know which bit of this data to reference? Well, we have an array called digit data, which is just all of the digits in order. So the value of the digit data array at position zero is the data for the symbol zero. The digit data array at position one is the data for the digit one. So when I say something like, if I reference the position of digit data at position seven, will have in it the byte which contains the segments for the visual digit seven on my display. Follow me there, <laughs> right? So once we found out whether that segment should be on or off, all I have to do is turn that segment on using that same digital write command, right? Let me upload that and we'll see that it should have done the exactly the same thing. 
there we go. So now we're cycling through from zero to nine. So same thing as before, except instead of having an 80 line bit of code, I have a six line bit of code doing the exact same thing. Oh, Palmer asked a good question. Why did you go in reverse alphabetical order? Yeah, so it's because um, this bit read function by default, um, this, uh, so it takes a variable, takes a byte and a bit to read, but the bits that it reads from are themselves in reverse numerical order. So when I say read bit, uh, bit three, it's going to read the bit that's third from the end. When I say read bit seven, it's going to read the, the first, um, bit in reading order. Um, and so... Um, I either could have written the segments in forward alphabetical order and then sort of read them backwards, or I chose to organize my data sort of in reverse alphabetical order and then read them forwards because um, I have my segment data in forward alphabetical order, right? So if my data is going to turn on pin, uh, turn on segment A, which is in position zero, I want a, uh, a number one in position zero, and position zero is this sort of last one in line here, right? So I, I put A at the end. If I want a, a digit to have segment B on, I need a one in position, uh, in bit number one, and bit number one, according to the bit read function, is this one here. So that's why these are in reverse alphabetical order. There's a, there's a way, of course, to write this code so that your things are reversed, but that's the sort of the way that I chose to organize it, right? So just another way of, um, encapsulating uh, encapsulating code in a function that sort of simplifies the display of things. Because now, if I need to um, uh, encapsulate um, another symbol that I haven't uh, taken care of yet, um, I can simply add it to this array. In fact, let's do that now. Um, so, and then, and then I swear we'll be done because we're coming up on the second 90 minutes of this 90 minute stream, which I can't believe. Thank you for hanging out with us tonight, guys. It's been great. And then we really will be done. But I want to demonstrate how this allows us to add things. So, um, let's add, uh, the letter F to the end of this sequence. So I'm going to call this, uh, letter F. And the letter F, let's say I want to count the zero through nine and then display an F. So an F is going to have segments. E, F, A, and G turn on, if I look at them there. So I'm going to define a new byte. And when you're working in binary or with bytes, you start them with a letter B so that it knows, the code knows this is not the number 111,111. It knows it's a binary value with 0, 0,1,1,0,1,1 1, 0, 1, 1, and so on. So the letter F is going to have, uh, the dot is off, the G is on, the F is on. What did I say? F, F and G, E and A. So uh, F, G, E, D, C, B, A. So this is going to be our F, which is going to have segments uh, A, E, F, and G. So I'm going to add that to the end of my array of digit data. Uh, and I guess I really what I should have done here is int a uh, number of digits. I'll just call them digits. Uh, I had 10. I now have 11. Um, so, and I'm gonna, the reason I'm gonna put that in a variable is because right down here I had my, I had my magic number uh, of num pins. Ah, yeah, so I'm gonna take this out, take that if statement out because our number, F is not going to be between uh, zero and nine anymore. Um, and, oh, I, that's right, I defined my number of symbols down here, um, but I really, I'm gonna, I'm gonna instead let my number of digits drive this array number of digits, right? So just to review, I added an element to this array, which is my, my digit data. Um, that member is this let f symbol, which I've defined with this new byte. Uh, I created this new variable that tell, reminds me that I have 11 of these things to loop through. And that's just so that when through I'm in my loop function, I make sure I loop through uh, the all of the members of that array, right? So if I haven't made a typo, if I upload that code, come back to the table, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, F. Hey, it worked, right? So by encapsulating that data into those into those arrays and then writing some code that would interpret them, I avoided having to write a whole bunch of new digital write commands. It gives me much more flexibility um, in writing that code. Um, 
not to take a, a too real of a life example to close this out tonight, but um, reasons you might want to have variability in uh, how your code functions is let's say that this seven segment display got installed upside down. Like let's say I did it with a seven segment display in a piece of uh, equipment recently. Um, if you had manually coded everything with digital writes, you'd have to manually go through and rewrite each of those digital write commands. But now that I've encapsulated which segments are on for which numbers sort of into that array, I just have to edit that sort of one screen worth of information, and that will change how all of those numbers are displayed. So I hear you asking, Jeff, this is how you control a single seven segment display, but my kit came with a four digit seven segment display. How do I control that? And unfortunately, that does have to be a topic for next week because it requires transistors, um, which we are going to make use of next week. Um, but for a little tease, there's a little wiring diagram of one kind of seven segment display uh, in the slides that you're seeing on screen now that you can reference if you wanna get a jump start on things. Um, but given that we are now almost three hours into a 90 minute stream, I think this is, uh, this is where we gotta call it for tonight. Um, this was a huge, a huge endeavor. Um, and uh, I hope it was helpful. I hope it's given you a, a more fundamental understanding of when we talk about voltages, when we talk about current, when we talk about resistance and power, and how we tie them together with our equations V equals IR and P equals IV. If you remember nothing else from tonight, P equals IV and V equals IR are the two things you should carry around with you for the rest of your circuit making time, because uh, that those are the two things that are going to really serve you best um, as you're trying to figure out all this information. Uh, and especially will serve you well next week when we talk about uh, ways of controlling things with higher currents and higher voltages using transistors and FETs and relays. And that's gonna be uh, a fun week, I think. And now that we have this sort of groundwork of vocabulary under my under our feet, I think that's uh, that's gonna be a really valuable thing to have as we dive into next week. Um, yeah, that's what I got, y'all. I hope you have a wonderful week out there. Um, stay sane, stay safe. Um, and we will, uh, we'll see you back here. If you, uh, if you find anything fun, feel free to send it to me. Um, there is a contact form on my website, jeff.glass. Uh, shoot me an email, shoot me a picture, shoot me something cool you're making. Um, shoot me questions, shoot me things that you're, that you're wondering about or trying to figure out or leave them in the comments of this video. Um, you're always welcome, of course, not to be a YouTuber. Uh, if you hit the subscribe button, you'll get a notification when all the new streams are coming up. Um, maybe a helpful thing for you. But uh, in the meantime, uh, have a wonderful week, y'all, and I will see you next time. Thanks.